There's one bacterium known to do mm -hmm. predation of the kind that you and I would think about it, that it, that it, that it hunts and engulfs other organisms. Mm -hmm. There are also some bacteria that seem to hunt in packs and then put mm -hmm. a lot of, they, they, they collectively um, put a lot of nasty chemicals into the area. And these chemicals are poisons and then they, then they sort of together, they eat whatever it is that they've killed. But most predation seems to start with single celled eukaryotes mm -hmm. and then becomes much more of a thing uh, with animals. If you're interested in hearing about some of the most profound and intricate ideas in all of biology, then this is the conversation for you. I speak to the evolutionary biologist and author, Olivia Judson, who's best known for her work on the sex lives of animals. Olivia recreates a four billion year long history of life and geology and explains how even the most insignificant and tiny of organisms can, by their sheer abundance over generations, create mountains, both remote islands in the middle of the ocean, alter the course of streams, change the color of the sky, and sink long forgotten cities deep under the earth. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is the Escape Sapiens podcast, supported by the Andrew von Brown Foundation. If you enjoy these conversations, you can help support me by liking, subscribing, and sharing. And now, here's Olivia Judson, reminding us of just how profoundly beautiful our world is, and how miraculous it is that we even exist at all. I hope you enjoy. Escaped sapiens. Let's start with the big question. How did life start and where? Nobody knows. Nobody has the slightest idea how life began. Um, to be perfectly honest, nobody even really knows what life is, which is to say that biology has no working definition of its subject. There are almost as many definitions as there are people in the field, uh, and some of them are mutually contradictory. So that doesn't make the origin of life any easier. Um, but I think that there are two fundamental approaches to the origin of life that could be interesting. One is you look at life today, which is obviously very different from uh, the life that would have first arrived or f first formed here um, because it's, it's had 4.5 billion years of evolution, roughly, maybe 4.2, maybe 3.5. We don't know, but whatever it is, it's a lot. Um, but you could, in principle, try to work backwards from biology, or you can try to work forwards from chemistry. Mm. And people do both. Um, personally, I am interested in working backwards from biology because I think that the biochemistry and the fossil record can indicate something about what the first life forms might have been like, uh, and that that can help to direct the way that one thinks about the, the problem. Are there some universals though? So for instance, if I gave you an example, uh, a fire, for instance, it consumes things, it reproduces, uh, is a fire life. And, and why would you, for example, cancel that out as being an option? Well, I think the obvious thing about fire is it doesn't have a body. Uh, that's arguable, right? It, it takes up some space. Yes, but it's immaterial. It's, mm. uh, it's, it's, it is energy by itself, if you like. It's doing chemistry. I mean, a fire is certainly doing chemistry and, and life forms do chemistry. And, um, you know, it's certainly fire is one of the recurrent analogies that people use for thinking about life. I mean, JBS Haldane, who is a, an important scientist in the 20s and 30s, he would he, he wrote something about life and flames. And um, it's it's um, it, it's it's a common metaphor, um, but it isn't the same. Uh, and I think it's 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 interesting to think about why it why it isn't the same, uh, but I think it clearly it clearly isn't the same. But I think that again, um, whether you th this gets to a whole set of questions: Do you think a virus is alive or not? Um, do you think a computer program is alive? What what is the nature of this thing that we're talking about? And and so far, I think nobody has come up with a completely uh, clear way to delineate between what is alive and what is not alive. I suppose one of the difficulties with the question is it really depends on the surroundings, right? It's it's not just the organism, but it's coupling to the environment. If, if I got shot up into space and was in the vacuum, then I wouldn't live very long. Or if there was just one uh, left of a species, then it can't propagate, then would you classify that as being alive because it won't be able to reproduce? Uh, and that's sort of important for the discussion today. Um, Can I interrupt? Sure. So I would say, first of all, it's a very, it's a very um, 
mammalian perspective to say that if there was only one member of a species left, then they wouldn't be able to propagate because plenty of organisms, in fact, the majority of organisms can, uh, you know, if you're thinking about bacteria, they just grow and divide and grow and divide and grow and divide, almost all of them. And, and so it's, it's, they, they're fine if they're just one. It's uh, it's just it's just our problematical situation where where it, it takes two. But nonetheless, there are environments where bacteria won't survive. If you threw them into the fire or you freeze some of them, uh, they won't survive. Right. So the the environment still is the external circumstances are very important uh, for the organism. Um, but so what I want to sort of segue into from from this is. If life had never existed on Earth, right? If, if we'd never had life, how would the environment be different? It would be utterly different, and I think to an extent that most people have no appreciation of. And this is what got me interested in the subject, was, was really realizing the full extent to which the planet that we experience today has been made what it is by the activities of life forms in the past. And it's nearly every aspect of the planet that you can that you can think of. It's um, deposits of minerals. It's the number and variety of minerals. It's the um, it's the oxygen that you breathe. Uh, it's it's obscure um, obscure compounds in the air like dimethyl sulfide. All of that is produced by life. Um, the shapes of rivers. All of that. Th those are determined by the roots of trees. And a planet without life would have completely different. Uh, I don't quite know what the word would be. Hydro uh, <laughs> morphology. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, the, the, um, there's, there's weathering that goes on. One of the things that I have become very interested in is the extent to which life forms really accelerate processes. Mm -hmm. And and so many things have just happened much faster as well because they would have happened anyway eventually like weathering happens anyway just by virtue of rain and things like that but the the activities of bacteria and and fungi and plants really accelerates those processes. And that's true of just about anything that you can think of. Um, what I the way that I've come to think of it is that life forms do quickly what geology does slowly. Uh, and there are, I, I can give two striking examples because it's not it's also not just that it's that it's faster it's also that the conditions in which it happens are, are less extreme so um, just to give the acceleration there are some enzymes that are thought to do in 18 milliseconds uh, things that would otherwise take 78 million years so that's an improvement of 17 orders of magnitude, which is quite a lot. Um, most are not quite so dramatic, but it's still millions of times faster than would otherwise happen. But then there are also um, there are there are enzymes like nitrogenase, which is uh, one of only three ways known to take nitrogen out of the air and make it available to uh, to organisms. The other two are lightning um, and the Harbour Bosch process by which we uh, make ammonia for fertilizer and other uses. And those, the lightning and the Harbour Bosch process obviously need quite extreme conditions. Mm. Organisms do it at room temperature. They, they don't usually like oxygen mm. around. So if they are exposed to oxygen, then they usually have some way of separating the activity of the of, of the oxygen from the activity of the nitrogenase some ways like they have a special compartment for the nitrogenase or they have they they um they use oxygen during the day but nitrogenase use to the nitrogenase reaction at night or something like that but nevertheless they can do it under normal circumstances uh, and a similar thing is one is one of my it's a little bit nerdy perhaps but um the smectite illite transformation so, Which is what? So smectite and illite are both clay minerals. And smectite is, is sort of squishy, and mm -hmm. illite looks more like mica, so it's sort of layered and a bit flaky. Mm -hmm. And in, um, without the involvement of bacteria, this would take five to six months at cooking it at 300 Celsius and 1,000 atmospheres of pressure, which is as if you were buried underneath the Eiger in Switzerland. Um, but if you add a bacterium called Shiwanella onidensis, uh, the whole thing will take place in um, two weeks at normal temperature and pressure. Mm. 
But so the short story there is that the chemical profile of the Earth is completely different. To, so if, if we were looking for life on another planet, these would be the, the signatures you'd look for chemically. Well, I think when you're trying to detect life from far away, as we are, then what you're looking for is signatures in the atmosphere. I think it's more, probably more difficult to, to detect signatures um, on the ground. But signatures in the atmosphere, I mean, that was proposed a long time ago. I mean, most notably by um, James Lovelock, who was best known for his ideas about Gaia. Um, and he, but one of the things that he first thought about was the idea that actually you could you would expect to see an atmosphere that contains gases that would not normally coexist, such as methane and oxygen. It, so in the Earth's atmosphere, we have a nice blue sky, right? If, if we had never had cyanobacteria, if we'd never had the, the life forms that have led up to today, would, the, would we have a red sky? What, what would it look like? So it depends on what the atmosphere contained. So if you look around at other places in the solar system, the moon has a black sky. That's because it has no atmosphere to speak of. Mars has a sort of dusty orange sky. Uh, and that's because of the, it's full of dust. The, the, the atmosphere is thin, uh, and, and what is there is mostly dust. Um, but Uranus and Neptune both have blue skies, um, so, but they don't have uh, a comfortable oxygen atmosphere. So, so it's, it's difficult to tell, but it, it is very likely that at certain times in the Earth's past, the sky has, first of all, been a different shade of blue, um, and or that it has been a sort of smoggish orange. And so what it would be like if there had never been life, that would depend on, on exactly what had accumulated in the air um, without the activity of life. But even if you look into the Earth's past, it's very likely that the, that the sky has changed color. Oh, I forgot Venus. Venus has a... <laughs> It's, 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 a, it's yellowish, isn't it? Yeah, sickly yeah. yellow, but also rather gloomy because very little light gets through the very thick atmosphere. So the surface of Venus is a very gloomy place. So chemistry is one thing, right? But in terms of what people can actually physically touch and, and see themselves. So I, I read one of your articles where you talked about the impact of worms and coral um, in particular. What, what, are the, what are the organisms that really dramatically change the environment that we can actually see and touch without having to talk about chemistry, let's say. Well, some of the earliest changes were the building of reefs, but they were the building of reefs by bacteria. So these the bacteria live in complex communities and can build structures such, that are called stromatolites. And stromatolites were discovered, I don't know, more than 100 years ago as fossils. And it was only in the 1950s that it turned out that there were still living examples. Mm. So uh, in Western Australia, for example, there are quite a lot of stromatolites in Shark Bay, mm. but also in some of the lakes around. Uh, there are also stromatolites in, in Mexico, uh, in the Bahamas. But, but throughout the fossil record, so, so the important thing, I think, is, is to remember that Earth's history is extremely long. So the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. We don't know exactly when life began to uh, appear, but it was at least 3.5 billion years ago. And it's probably, in my opinion, closer to 4.2. So let's mm -hmm. say there's been 4.2 billion years of life. But it's only really in the last 600 million years that we have animals. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and yet the earth changed profoundly in that time due to the activities of life. And a lot of this, uh, the most tangible thing from that sort of enormous span of, of time, the most tangible thing are stromatolites. And they, in fact, there's a, there's a short story um, in which, uh, by Margaret Atwood, in which the murder weapon is a fossil stromatolite. <laughs> <laughs> well, are these just uh, clumps of... of so if you were to see one today, you would, it, I mean, it, it, it's, not, it's not super beautiful, I have to say. It, it's, it's intriguing, I think, when you, when you approach it knowing what it is. But basically, it, it looks like a slightly slimy um, sort of footrest. Right. Uh, <laughs> so ugly coral. No, uh, it's much less, at least the ones that I've seen, uh, mm -hmm. have much less structure than coral. I mean, mm -hmm. coral, um, or mm, I should put it differently, they have much less obvious structure than coral. When you look at a coral, you, you know, you see all these invaginations and, and mm -hmm. often colors as well. 
And the stromatolites that I've seen didn't really have much in the way of bright colors. So they had more of a kind of dark blackish color or grayish color or sometimes a reddish color, but they but they but they not they're not tremendously striking. I mean, I and I don't think it would be very obvious that they were actually alive unless you were poking them and touching them and realizing that they're very slimy and slime is a usual quite good re- indicator of something having been produced by life. Um, but also, if you look closely, they're going to be releasing bubbles of gas because mm-hmm. they're metabolizing underwater. And so you can start to see these streams of, these streams of gas. Um, but at other times in the history of the Earth, they, some of them reached really large proportions like, like, and, and also extended over areas as, as, as large as the Barrier Reef in Australia. So, so then I think if you were time traveling, you would be pretty clear that this is a, some kind of life environment. But I think at the same time, you would, you know, if you were scuba diving in the ancient, on, in the oceans of the ancient earth, you would, uh, you would notice that there were no fish, for example. Mm. But so in terms of, um, so if I, if I look out the window and, and I, I see some clay or some, or if I look at the marble buildings, or how much of the materials around us just simply wouldn't be here? I look at the cliffs of Dover. Those are completely composed of uh, small little crustacean uh, organisms, right? Um, so the cliffs of Dover would not be here. The cliffs of Dover are composed of the shells of coccolithophores. Coccolithophores are single-celled algae that are covered with plates that look a bit like frisbees, like microscopic frisbees. I mean, they're, they're very, very tiny. So one of the things that I think is astonishing about these organisms, they flourished at the time of the dinosaurs, particularly in the Cretaceous, when the Earth had a lot of shallow inland seas. Um, the sea levels were generally higher at that time, and so a lot of areas were f- that now are dry were flooded. Um, but coccolithophores, each one is microscopic, but they can occur in extremely large numbers and such large numbers that you, you can see patches from space that are, that are blooms of co- coccolithophores. And over, you know, when they die, these, um, these shells fall to the bottom um, and sometimes they will dissolve on the way. It depends on the particular details of the chemistry of the ocean, but sometimes they will go all the way down and then they just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And I think this is one of the things that's very difficult to really uh, fully appreciate. It comes back to this question of spans of time. And I think that it's, um, it's, it's hard to get the numbers across. I mean, it's easy to say four million, but what people hear is four. <laughs> they don't hear the zeros. Mm. And, and I think even people who work with these numbers all the time, I still think that they don't, you know, it's very difficult to really conceive of what does, what does a, a million years mean? What does a billion mm. years mean? It's, it's difficult to conceive of it. And it's difficult to really think how, ex, you know, how something, how a process left undisturbed over that length of time, how it can really be transformational. You could think of it as the power of the many, you know, mm. many small organisms with a lot of time can really change the world and mm. have done. I mean, one of the ways that I like to think about time and sort of remind myself uh, of these spans of time is to remember that that one million seconds is about 11 and a half days, mm. but one billion seconds is more than 31 years. Mm. And that is some way to sort of realize that, that the scale is expanding in ways that, that are still difficult to relate to. Do you think it makes sense to separate geology and biology as subjects? Or are they so intertwined that you can't really do that? I would say it doesn't make any sense. And uh, and looking back, I'm slightly resentful of my undergraduate curriculum, which required physics but not geology as part of a biology degree. Hmm. Because, but that's not true everywhere. In places like France, they're still taught together, for example. Most, hmm. in, even in high school, biology and geology are often taught together, and the teachers are expected to be uh, fluent in both. And for me now, I can see that there are some aspects of geology that may not have uh, much relationship to biology, the same as I suppose there are probably some aspects of biology. You know, if you're studying the detail of a cell, maybe geology is not hugely important. But in order to understand the history of life and Earth, in order to understand what it is that we're actually part of, and in order to understand the processes of the Earth, then you have to study biology and geology together. 
When did we start piecing together the story? How, how is the story that, uh, for instance, we have coral atolls and, and uh, put together? And how, how, how did we get um, this image that we have sort of a, I don't want to say Gaia, but we have this living earth where, where all the structures that we see around us are to, to a large extent shaped uh, by organisms? So people have, have speculated about the impact of life forms for a long time. I mean, certainly... Uh, Comte de Buffon, for example, in the uh, in the uh, 18th century, he was very interested in the possibility that that um, that life forms were impacting the Earth. Um, uh, Lamarck was also who was uh, is better known for some of his early ideas about evolution, but he he was um, he was very interested in the idea that life forms might affect the formation of minerals. It's his writing is difficult to follow because he even for his time his chemistry was archaic and it's difficult to know exactly what it is he means but he's I mean what I, what I think is interesting about Lamarck is he's sort of he's groping towards an idea for which he doesn't have the vocabulary and I think it's always interesting to see somebody who, who has in, intuited something but they can't fully give voice to it because because the, the, the equipment to do so just isn't there. The linguistic, the scientific equipment just isn't there. Um, and then, um, but I think, I think one of the people who is most interesting to me personally is, is Darwin. Uh, Darwin, as everybody knows, uh, in 1859 published on the origin of species, which is uh, the founding uh, book of modern biology. In, and in the origin of species, he advances ideas about natural selection and, and also presents an enormous amount of evidence from as many fields as he could draw on that show that evolution occurs. But if you look at his work more broadly, you notice that his first book and his last are both works of biogeology. And the first book is uh, about coral reefs and the last book is about earthworms. And both of them have Darwin's characteristic um, um, tendency for detail. Um, but the, the Coral Reef book is really, uh, it's an amazing piece of work. I actually must say I find it rather boring to read. Um, <laughs> but in terms of the mass of work that he had to do, because at that time there was no global map of coral reefs. And so he, in fact, compiled the first one. And he was, he was, he was very puzzled by the question of how is it that in places like the Indian Ocean, in the middle of nowhere, where there is no continent nearby, you suddenly have these low flat islands appearing mm. that have the same general form. Uh, they, they, um, in, they, they're very often low and flat. Like if you look at the islands of the Maldives, for example, they, often the, the total height above sea level is two meters. Mm. Um, and they consist of sand and coral and trees. And he was, he was very interested to think about why it is that that you had these these things in the middle of the ocean and he suggested that they were built by life on the tops of um basically that there had once been a volcano that had appeared above the surface and the volcano had subsided and the corals had grown on, along the fringes and that they had continued to grow and his prediction was that if you if you drill down far enough into a volcano, sorry, into, a, into an atoll. If you drill down far enough into an atoll, you will find basalt. Mm. Um, and it turned out, it wasn't, until, it wasn't until the 1940s and 50s that it became possible to, to do that. Other people tried several times to, to, to do this drilling, but it wasn't until um, the Americans were doing the, um, these nuclear tests in the mm. Marshall Islands that it became possible to really go down far enough because the previous expeditions, they had drilled down as far as was possible, but they had still arrived at coral. Mm. And it was in the, it was on the Enuetak Atoll. They drilled down and estimated that they, they found basalt, uh, but they also estimated that the coral cap uh, on this submerged volcano was um, 250 cubic miles. <laughs> so how deep is that? Uh, I can't remember. It's how like deep a kilometer it is. or something. I right? think it's more than I think it's more than that, but it's um, I think it's over a kilometer. But it's it's um, it's 
it has we from looking at the fossils in the uh, in the cores drilled, we know that the uh, the coral began to grow more than fifty million years ago. Mm. So uh, they, it may not have grown continuously because sometimes sea levels change. You know, it goes down, it goes up. Mm. Um, if corals can't keep pace, then then they can't. You know, if if, it, if the sea level goes down, the corals on top die. Um, but that basically the, these, these structures, which are so much part of our oceans and so much part of our delight, um, are, um, are constructions of, it's a, it's a life earth co-production. So when you say the organism can't keep pace, what you mean by that is, if I understand, is that, uh, slowly you get this volcano and slowly over time it recedes back. Uh, into the ocean, it, it sort of drops down beneath the waves. If it happens slowly enough, the coral can keep pace with it and they would just build on, on dead coral, essentially, as time goes by. Yeah, that's right. But if, if the subsidence happens too rapidly, um, then, then, the, then the, the corals can't, they can't stay in the light. Most corals um, are, so most corals are actually the animal, vegetable, mineral all at once. Mm. Um, so the basic organism is is an animal but most of them not all of them but most of them live in symbiosis with uh, something that photosynthesizes um, and so therefore uses the sun's light um, to uh, as as its uh, way of capturing energy um, and then also obviously many corals make these stone structures they they take calcium um, sorry, they take carbon dioxide from the air and, and the water and calcium from the, from the water and they, and they make these um, calcium carbonate skeletons. If everything goes down too fast, then, then the, the, um, the, the coral algal uh, community hmm. can't grow. Hmm. And so there are places, um, there, are, there are seamounts that are disappearing in some places um, where it seems that the, the processes have stopped. I remember when I was first learning about evolution and about Darwin, I sort of, I always thought, initially I thought he was overrated uh, in the sense that a school child can understand evolution, right? The, the basic picture, at least. Whereas if you compare Darwin to say Newton or Einstein, they're dealing with really abstract ideas that it's very hard to explain uh, at, at depth to a child, let's say. But the more I read about Darwin, the more I understand that one of his specialties was making complex ideas simple enough. And that is actually a skill in itself. He, he could somehow see mundane aspects of the world and build them up to the, an amazing picture that no one had ever thought of before. And I, I find it amazing that he touched so many aspects of biology. And, and eventually I sort of started thinking that it was more underrated than overrated. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, if, if you could go back in time and tell him anything about the world that we've discovered uh, since his death, what would, you, what would you choose? The age of the earth. He, the, he, he, did, he had no idea? Nobody, nobody knew. He tried to calculate it. Uh, he was one of a number of people who tried to calculate it. His, his get, he, he estimated, I think, 300 million years old, mm -hmm. um, which was actually on the, on the long side of, of the estimates that were put forward at the time. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the things that was very difficult for people uh, in the 19th century was that because animal, uh, animals don't evolve until rather late in Earth history, you have this enormous span of time that is pre-animal and that doesn't have the sorts of fossils that is that are able that it makes it easy to compare and so and so once you've sort of said okay well we have we have this animal fossil record and then and then it's sort of then then what is before that is very different um, then then it becomes sort of difficult to really scale the times mm. of so i mean traditionally earth history was divided into pre-cambrian which is the first four billion years <laughs> roughly and uh and from and then from the origin of animals roughly 560 million years 600 million years ago so um, we needed radioactive dating that's right that so right? it wasn't until and, and it wasn't really i think it wasn't until the 1950s that it was established clearly um, and so, and I think that for Darwin, it would have actually, it would have been surprising and actually maybe a bit shocking 
mm. because it's it's so long. And in fact, this is something I think is very interesting: is that is that um, so much of Earth history is just about bacteria and another group of microscopic organisms, the archaea. Mm. And the two of them appear, both bacteria and archaea appear to have uh, formed around the same time through these mysterious processes that we don't know anything about. Um, but, but for- Is it gonna happen three times? Uh, no, just once. Um, but but the um, the thing that's uh, ast that is really astonishing is that the progressive idea that most people the naive progressive idea that most people have have of evolution so the idea that it's fish and then amphibians mm -hmm. and reptiles and birds and mammals that that part of Earth history doesn't start until very late and mm -hmm. for most of the for for the vast uh, you know for most of Earth history for the vast span of time it's it's something rather different is going on mm -hmm. and and so i think that it's i think that he might have been rather perplexed by that i mean one has the feeling that darwin was not so much involved with thinking about things like bacteria mm -hmm. um and and i think that that would have been troubling to him perhaps we'll talk about the epochs of life going back to archaea and bacteria and so on uh in, in a bit but I, I just want to end up on this sort of uh, topic, the impact of uh, biology on geology. If all life was extinguished tomorrow, right? Uh, everything, bacteria, archaea, everything. How long would it take before the earth became sort of a, a never, uh, something where you'd say it never had life on it? it uh, the chemistry, the geology, everything looks like it had never had life. So I have no idea, but my guess is that it would take a very long time. That, the, that there are just too many dimensions of the planet. I mean, there are some things that might fade away relatively quickly, um, but I think that the that erasing everything would take many hundreds of millions of years, maybe longer, maybe billions of years. Maybe maybe the sun would, would uh, incinerate the earth before all trace was gone. I mean, traces of humans might disappear more quickly, but in terms of the, the total trace, I think mm. it would be much, much longer. But I, I'm, just, I'm just speculating wildly. Mm. I don't know. I haven't thought about it. I suppose the age of the atolls we discussed was 50 million years, right? Mm -hmm. And the earth will presumably be around for a couple more billion years. And so they're different length scales, right? So I imagine eventually we would get rid of all traces, but... Yes, you know. although the whole planet might still be working in a different sort of way because, because, mm. of, the, because of the fact that there has been life here. Um, mm. But I really, I really don't know uh, mm. how long it would take. I, I've, I've been thinking about the past, not, the, not that aspect of the future. So let's then talk about the past. How many planets has Earth been? So, so in other words, you know, if you were if you were writing a book about the history of the, the Earth, um, what would the chapters be? Well, I mean, I, there are so many ways to divide it up, and I think this is a matter of uh, personal taste. But the way that the way that I have come to think about it is that you can think of uh, you can think of the history of life and Earth in terms of five epochs. And epoch may actually not be quite the right word for what I'm talking about, but I'll come back to that in a moment. So, so, and each epoch corresponds to the evolution of life forms that use a different source of energy. And the idea is, my, my, my conception of this is that um, over time, that has expanded. So, mm -hmm. so in other words, and that's why I think epoch is potentially a bit misleading it's the word that i've because used they overlap. because it's not just that they overlap they 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 it, they fan out on top of each other mm -hmm. and so that so epoch sort of suggests and that each thing comes to an end mm -hmm. but that's not correct they don't come to an end and in fact within each mode of e within each energetic um possibility you often also have uh, expansions during the history of life. So an obvious thing would be early in life, life history, you, you have the evolution of, um, of life forms that can use the light of the sun. Um, for a long time, those are mostly bacteria, not exclusively, but mostly. Um, and then around 470 million years ago, you start to get plants on land. Uh, and that is obviously another big and dramatic shift in the way that the earth works. 
Um, and but it's it's a sort of a, it's also an extension of the ability to use light. So the epochs, as I have been thinking about them, are. Um, well, you could poetically call it rock, but more technically it would be geochemistry. Um, light, oxygen, flesh, and mm -hmm. fire. And the idea is that um, my, my, my contention is um, that the first life forms uh, were what you might call rock eaters. The technical term for them is um, chemolithoautotrophs. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's kind of ugly. It sort of it basically means that they are uh, able to grow from rocks and gases, mm -hmm. um, water, rocks and gases. Um, and there are a lot of them around even today. And there's some biochemical reasons to think that that they were among the first life forms. Um, then later, because the biochemistry is more complex, you get the evolution of of life forms that can use the light of the sun. Mm -hmm. um, to grow from. And the main way to do that is to use uh, chlorophyll, the molecule chlorophyll. And there are lots of different bacteria that can use that. Um, but the most interesting ones are the cyanobacteria, which are interesting from our point of view because they, um, they split oxygen. Sorry, the they cyanobacteria split water and release oxygen as a byproduct. And so before around two and a half billion years ago, roughly 2.4, 2.3, 2.4, 2 um, there was no oxygen gas in the air uh, to speak of. So there were oxygen atoms. Um, Earth had plenty of oxygen. It's a very abundant element. But they were all tied up in other things like carbon dioxide or, or water. And then around two and a half, 2.4 billion years ago, you have this change where oxygen becomes abundant in the, in the atmosphere for the first time. And that seems to have been a consequence of the chemistry of the Earth itself and the activities of this group of organisms, the cyanobacteria. And so you could, I, I would argue that they're perhaps the most important life forms in the history of the Earth. And the, the availability of oxygen created new possibilities for biology, but it also was geologically hugely important. And it's with the appearance of oxygen that you start to get an enormous increase in the number of different minerals that Earth has. Because oxygen, I sort of think of oxygen as a sort of wheeler dealer type. He's, he's always getting involved. Um, he's always making deals. You know, he's always intruding. He, he's, he's, he's kind of pushy. Oxygen is always, is always wanting to take part in, in whatever's happening. And particularly in the presence of water, for some reason, a lot of these a lot of these reactions take place more easily if things are a bit wet. You know, think about rusting. Rusting mm -hmm. happens in wet climates much more quickly than it happens in dry climates. And and rusting is a process of oxygen becoming involved. Um, and and so when you have this start to have this accumulation of oxygen in the air, you also start to have a big change in the surface chemistry of the Earth and a proliferation of minerals. Um, but if we so I'll, I'll jump onto uh, photosynthesis in a second but if we look back at the rock eaters so today I am, my conception is that something like 99% of all biomass comes from photosynthesis initially something along these lines I, I don't know the actual numbers but a large percentage before what was the chemistry of the rock eaters like what what how did they get their energy before what does it actually mean for them to be rock eaters so so, okay, so the nightmare of all chemistry, well, maybe not all chemistry students, but the nightmare of this chemistry student um, and a lot of biology students is a kind of chemical reaction called redox. Mm -hmm. And redox is oxidation reduction, and it essentially, it essentially involves the transfer of electrons. And mm -hmm. the, the, the language is terribly confusing, uh, I think partly because reduction is actually a word um, that was uh, important in alchemy. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a hangover from sort of the the earliest uh, days of chemistry because alchemists you know we, we tend to think of them as all trying to, to to make gold but actually they were doing serious chemistry experiments it's just that they didn't have the tools and ways of analysis that we have now and they were what one of the things that they were interested in is showing that for example you can you can take silver you can dissolve it in this you can dissolve it in that you can heat it you can cook it and then at the end you get silver back again mm. 
And so reduction is from the Latin to lead back. And so it was this idea that despite having done all this stuff, you could get silver out again. And the idea was to, sh it was basically to show that there's a conservation of mass, in fact, mm -hmm. that, you know, you start with this amount of silver and you have this amount of silver at the end, even though all of this torture to silver has gone on in the meantime and it's been dissolved in things and, and, and so on. And, but the idea of, of redox is that, is that electrons and, and often then atoms and molecules start to become rearranged. And this is, this is one of the main uh, mechanisms of, um, en of energy extraction in mm. life forms. You, they do redox reactions. And so in order to think about um, the earliest life forms, you could think about, for example, the process by which archaea, which are visually like bacteria, but internally somewhat different, um, you could think about something like an archaea, which will um, reduce carbon dioxide to methane. Mm -hmm. um, so from very early in Earth history, you had almost certainly had this process going on. There's a lot of reason to think that some of the earliest life forms were in fact reducing carbon dioxide and releasing methane as part of their meta metabolism. Mm -hmm. So they basically eat hydrogen carbon dioxide and, and release methane. Um, and and similarly, um, there, I mean, there's if you if you start to open a book of microbiology, you will discover that there's an enormous range of possible metabolisms for bacteria and archaea. Um, really, I mean, they they are the champions of metabolism. They have an enormous metabolic diversity, and many of these metabolisms um, are essentially just growing from the rocks and uh, gases of the earth. So. Why is it then that it's it's like 500 million years or something before the cyanobacteria and oxygen starts being produced in large quantities? Why did it take so long for that to happen? Is it because evolution is slow or did, was there some external uh, factor like meteorites? I, I, don't, I don't know the history. Why, why did that happen after so much time and did it only happen once? What's the story there? So there, I think that it, you you have asked several questions in, in one there. So mm. there are several different questions. One is, when do cyanobacteria appear? Mm. And the answer is nobody knows. Um, they do seem to have evolved once. So this particular way of growing from, uh, of, of dividing water to release oxygen, that is their speciality. There are other bacteria that, that grow from sunlight that do other things. Like, for example, they will, they will uh, grow from hydrogen sulfide and release um, sulfur. Mm -hmm. um, but the cyanobacteria are the only ones that release oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're, they're evolved by date, so to speak, which is to say the latest time that they appeared is around the time of the Great Oxidation, which is about 2.4 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but it's possible that they evolved somewhat earlier than that. There's, so in the history of the Earth, almost the only thing that everybody agrees on is that there was, a time before, there was a time in Earth history without oxygen in the air, and then there was a time with oxygen in the air. Um, and that that line occurs roughly 2.4 billion years ago. But the, um, when cyanobacteria appeared, that's very controversial. Uh, it's also, um, to come back to the ways that life format, you, know, you, you think, you know, how can a bacterium, how can bacteria actually change the world? And again, it comes back to this fact that they're very, very numerous. So I had a colleague calculate for me how long it would take one cyanobacterium to make enough oxygen for one human breath. And the answer was between 100 million and 1 billion years. <laughs> but even, I mean, today cyanobacteria can be incredibly abundant. So in the oceans, for example, there's a, there's a tiny cyanobacterium that lives in the in the sort of in the middle of the Pacific and, and places where there's not much else going on, and the estimated population of this of this tiny cyanobacterium, whose name is Prochlorococcus, is ten to the twenty seventh, mm. which is enormous. I mean, it's just mm. huge. And so when you think about an, an Earth um, early in in the history of the Earth, you you have to also think, okay, well, in order for oxygen to accumulate. Um, First of all, everything that could potentially react with the oxygen has to go away. Mm -hmm. So the, the metals that are going to rust, the, the minerals that are going to form, all of that has to start to happen. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, the, uh, you know, it, just, it may be, we don't know enough, but it may be that at first cyanobacteria were not very abundant. That the, that the process is, you know, if you think about, um, I mean, ultimately, it has to be geological processes that allow for the accumulation of oxygen. Um, but 
um, exactly what happened and, and what the populations were like. I mean, it's just, it's just so hard to know. It's so hard to look back into the, and I, I you know, this is not what I, I read the literature. What I, what I don't do is, is look at rocks and calculate isotopes. And, and that's what, you know, mm-hmm. what a lot of the geochemists are doing. And I think it's remarkable, the picture that we have, uh, you know, that it's as good as it is. I see. So it, it's difficult to tell when cyanobacteria first came into existence because initially there would have been some number of them producing oxygen, but that oxygen would have been reacting with all the min- minerals that were there on the planet. And at some point after that reaction had happened, or they were all finished, let's say, or come into some sort of equilibrium, then uh, the atmosphere can start absorbing um, more oxygen. Is that the picture broadly i mean also you have to have um carbon being buried sulfur being buried things that would react with oxygen have to accumulate you know there has to be a there has to be a bit of an imbalance because mm. you, if you think about biology maybe maybe once oxygen is being produced then other organisms can start to use it um and in their own metabolisms um and so then it's being taken away again so so there's a lot of there's a lot of different factors that need to come together for the planet to be able to produce oxygen and there are certainly people who've suggested that that some planets even if it was being produced would never be able to accumulate it maybe they were too big so that so that the the composition of the atmosphere is sort of held you know because one of the things that happens is that hydrogen gradually escapes to space over time and hi- the loss of hydrogen means that you can't ever reform the water molecule that the oxygen was part of. The hydrogen's gone away. Um, and if you're a big planet with higher gravity, maybe that process can't happen. Um, or if you are more volcanic, if you're constantly erupting, um, then perhaps there's just too much gas that the oxygen can react with. Maybe maybe there's just too much gas in the air. Um, so so it's, it's, um, it, it seems that... Uh, I think the best way to think about it is that is that we're lucky in that the earth was such that oxygen was able to accumulate because because oxygen then permitted so many mm. other things to happen later. So I asked you a few questions at the same time. The other question was has it only happened once? So if we look back in the in the record are the trees of today related to the cyanobacteria of the past? Ah, okay. Well, so that's a that's a much more complex question. Um, so, this brings me to um, to one of my one of my favorite subjects, I suppose. Um, so, does the word eukaryote mean anything to you? This is something with a, um, a um, inside the cell where we have the nucleus. Right. That's the, yeah. Right. So, when you look around without using a microscope pretty much everything you're going to see is a eukaryote. So this is a technical word in biology. It's not very well known outside biology, but it's when you look around, pretty much everything is. So you're a eukaryote, I'm a eukaryote, the dog is a eukaryote, but so are trees and um, any any animal, any plant, any fungus, but also uh, lots of single-celled life forms. So the coccolithophores we were talking about earlier, amoebas, um, lots of things are eukaryotes. And the formation but of- Not e- bacteria or archaea. Arche- bacteria and archaea are not eukaryotes. Okay. That's sort of the difference. And this is one of the things that's, that's I, 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 I like to think about it, that the- the 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 history of the history of discovery is not the same as the history of the earth mm-hmm. so everything that people knew about for most of human history and thought they were also eukaryotes and so there's no word for it except for the sec- technical scientific one because you didn't need a word to unify everything because everything that was just life mm-hmm. and then the microscope becomes uh, invented in the 17th century and people started to realize that actually there were lots of small things that we didn't know about um, but but eventually this re- this resolved this this picture resolved into the idea that there were actually cells that had a nucleus and cells that didn't and the ones that didn't were called bacteria but The thing that is curious about this is that even at that time, bacteria were not thought to be more ancient than the eukaryotes. So in fact, for a long time, the most ancient um, organism was thought to be an amoeba. And the reason for this is quite interesting as well, because um, until you have an electron microscope, you cannot see the cell membrane. You can see cell walls, which many bacteria, most of them have. So they have a membrane and then a wall. Mm An amoeba just has a membrane. And so what it looks like through a simple microscope is 
a droplet of living matter that moves and eats and chases things and, 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 and is somehow self-contained and holding itself together. Um, and nobody knew how that was happening. And so it was considered to be extremely primitive. Um, and it was only later that it became realized that actually bacteria um, evolved much earlier than eukaryotes. So eukaryotes don't appear in the history of the Earth until about 1.8 billion years ago, whereas bacteria have been here for at least 3.5, 3.8, 4 4.2 billion years. So there's a, a long lag. Um, but in, so in order, so, so the history of land plants they had to, so eukaryotes had to evolve because land plants are eukaryotes. Um, but then also the capacity to photosynthesize had to evolve. And it turns out, so, so in order for this to be uh, interesting, I think it, it's worth spending a moment talking about the formation of eukaryotes. So this is a controversial subject in biology, but I think the, um, there's, so there's a number of camps um, the camp that I think is most likely to be correct is that um, the formation of eukaryotes was the result of a fusion between bacteria and archaea. So you have these lineages that are evolving independently, and then two of them come back together. And so when you look at a eukaryotic cell, it, it has a medley of eukaryotic, uh, sorry, it has a medley, it has its own distinct eukaryotic traits, but it also has bacterial and archaeal traits. Mm -hmm. And in addition to having the nucleus, it also has mitochondria. And mitochondria are, in you and me, they're very important in energy generation. Um, all, euka all eukaryotes have or have had mitochondria. They, obviously, they continue to evolve. They, they used to be bacteria. Um, but they, they have continued to evolve. And so the, the, the range of um, tasks that mitochondria do and the amount of DNA they have varies from one lineage to another. But you can think of it as, as uh, I, I think it's rather beautiful actually, because you have, you have this, this early origin which had bacteria and archaea and then they evolve separately for several billion years. And then two of the lineages come back together and begin a third lineage, which is the eukaryotes. Now, one of the characteristics of eukaryotes, which is quite different from bacteria and archaea, is that they engage in symbiosis with other organisms very easily in the sense that they quite often take other organisms inside themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to form land plants, it seems that the, um, there were several different things that had to happen, but one of, them, one of the things that happened is a eukaryotic cell formed an association with a cyanobacteria. So the cyanobacteria, um, the, so the chloroplast, which is what allows a plant to um, harvest the sun's light, the chloroplast is derived from an ancient union with a eukaryotic cell and a cyanobacterium. Um, and then obviously they had to come onto land and become multicellular and all those things. But, but so in your picture then is, so for the eukaryotes, which have a cell nucleus, mm -hmm. Is the idea that the nucleus itself is, for example, uh, an absorbed archaea and the, uh, the external is a bacteria, or what's the picture there? So the picture is um, complicated, but the, the essential idea is not that the nucleus was absorbed from something else, mm -hmm. but it's certainly the case that some of the ways that DNA gets processed are the archaeal methods, so to speak. Um, the nucleus, nobody really knows how it formed, partly because studying this is very, you know, there's no real fossils that are informative about this subject. So you have to make a lot of inferences. And as I said, everybody's guessing really. Um, but the, um, the, let's see, it's, I think the easiest way to think of it is that there's a sort of mosaic of traits. And so the, there was such a complete fusion of mm -hmm. these two organisms that you you find um, you find many aspects of both in mm -hmm. the eukaryotic cell. The presence of a nucleus seems to be an innovation, um, and um, allows eukaryotic cells to have potentially have quite a lot more DNA mm -hmm. um, than most bacteria. Do. So that's re required for complex life. Well, I'm not really keen on complex versus simple because I don't mm -hmm. think the bacteria are simple. Mm 
I, I prefer sort of more complex and less complex, perhaps. I mean, I, I think, I mean, complex is such a, it's a sort of loaded term. And I, I think that, but let's say complex of life. Well, let's say multicellular. No, Did, no, no, no. So before that, we with the archaea, we had sort of... Well, so, so archaea and bacteria, neither of them has a cell nucleus. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing, the reason I wouldn't say multicellular is because so many eukaryotes are single-celled. Mm-hmm. Most, most of them are single And do we have colonial, we have colonial bacteria in archaea, right? You do, is, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting though, compared to, compared to the, um, the multicellular form that, um, that you and I take, for example, mm-hmm. or that a plant takes, um, cyanobacteria, for example, often grow in colonies, but they tend to be filaments. Mm-hmm. Um, and even many eukaryotes, many single-celled eukaryotes, will sometimes grow in colonies, but they tend to, what tends to happen is that each cell remains in contact with the medium. So each cell is essentially able to feed itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so in some, there is a, there's a group that is thought to be ancestral to animals called the coanoflagellates. And today they have some forms that are essentially just sort of um, flat sheets of cells, but it's, it's one cell thick. Uh, so everybody's living in a sort of matrix, but that matrix is one cell thick, and every cell, every cell is still feeding itself. They can they can get a sort of um, an advantage of of scale by being able to swim a bit faster or a bit further or whatever. But nevertheless, everybody is doing their own feeding. Mm-hmm. Um, but so the, the in terms of the innovations, to use your word, so there's uh, the development of a cell nucleus. Then there's the absorption of a cyanobacteria to make a chloroplast. So that's what plants have. And then there's the mitochondria, which is also absorbed uh, in a similar way. So mitochondria is, in my view, I take, I take the view, um, that certainly not unique to me, but it's controversial. I take the view that, my, that, the, that, the, that the chloroplast is a secondary event, mm-hmm. um, that it, it happens after the advent of the eukaryotic cell. But that the, in my view, the formation of the eukaryotic cell is about the formation of the mitochondria. To, in my view, it's the mitochondria that well, is more important. plants also have mitochondria. Yes. I see. Yeah. In fact, so, so plants have three genomes because they have mm-hmm. their own nuclear genome, the mitochondrial genome and the chloroplast genome. But there are some algae that have five mm-hmm. um, because, in fact, they they consumed something. They had their own nucleus and mitochondria, and then they consumed something that had three um, Sorry if I stop you for a second. So, so what energy source does my, mitochondria allow you to take advantage of? Uh, that depends a little bit on what sort of organism you are, but in the case of you and me, it's oxygen. Mm-hmm. So, so this might be a silly question, but why don't we see plants that run around and you know are more animal-like in nature? Well, I think that that's quite a profound question, really. I mean, I think the question is, what is an animal? And it turns out that an animal is a lineage and plants have, plants have a very different structure to their cells and it's almost certainly not possible for them. Certainly if they're, if they're just photosynthesizing, they mm-hmm. don't get enough energy to do a lot of moving around. Um, if, if they, um, you know, I, I suppose it's really, in some ways it's a question of form mm-hmm. um, and so you'd have to eat something as well to be able to get enough energy to really move around as a, in a self-propelled sort of way. Mm-hmm. But I, I think I'm not being very clear at this point. I, I have the feeling that I'm, I'm being a little... A no, little... no, you're being very clear. <laughs> but, so, but so the, I guess the, the question that I'm interested in um, is what makes oxygen so much more of an efficient energy source? So to be um, more precise, the the rock eaters may have used sulfur or something like this, right? And I imagine that sulfur is annoying because it's then in solid form after you excrete it, whereas oxygen is nice because, uh, sorry, carbon dioxide is nice because it just sort of blows away after you've um, exhaled. So that that's one nice feature of oxygen. But is oxygen also just energy, more energy dense than say what the rock eaters were using or... I don't think energy dense is quite the right word, but it's more that it's it's more that um, in terms to come back to this idea of redox of electron transfer, electron transfer to oxygen releases more energy than almost any other reaction that takes place normally at the surface of the Earth, and the other ones that could come close to it are chlorine and fluorine, but they're both obviously not very 
um, that they're so, particularly fluorine is so reactive that n nothing can really, you know, it would just, you would just be sort of exploding mm -hmm. all the time. Um, so ox oxygen is, is um, there's, it's just very efficient in terms of if, if you transfer electrons onto oxygen, you just mm -hmm. get more energy out. So it's, it's more efficient for each electron moved. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but you know, I think there's, there's two things to think about. There's, there's that, but there's also the fact that um, evolution um, is not trying to do animals, say, right? right. So, so it turns out that animals are able to, particularly large animals, can, can eat a lot, burn it all up by using oxygen and move around and get more mm. uh, food. Um, but evolution was not setting out to do that. Mm. Um, and, and so I, I think that it's also important to think about oxygen did not cause the first mm. animals. It permitted mm -hmm. the first animals. It permitted eukaryotes. It permitted the first animals. And when I say it permitted eukaryotes, what I really mean is that the fusion that took place between the archaean and the bacterium, um, the bacterium seems to have had the capacity to use oxygen. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always use it. There are plenty of eukaryotes that, that, don't, that don't use this metabolic possibility, but it was present in the ancestor and many of the descendants do use oxygen. Um, but it's more to, to think about the idea that, um, that the surface changed, the atmosphere changed, and that this then permitted new, poss new possibilities. Um, and just in, in con connection with that, one of the other consequences of the accumulation of oxygen was the, uh, was the inception of the ozone layer. So mm -hmm. ozone is, if oxygen gas is O2, ozone is O3. And it's an unstable molecule. And down here at, at, um, at, at this height where we are today, it, it, it's not very good for you. But in the stratosphere, which is where most of the ozone is found, uh, it acts as a, as, a, as a sort of shield from some of the most um, violent rays of the sun. And so from the time of the Great Oxidation, there has been an ozone layer. So that changed the circumstances on which um, that prevail on the surface of the land. Mm -hmm. so, and, uh, so basically anything that has evolved subsequent to that has evolved in the context of an ozone layer. And mm -hmm. so it's not necessarily that you need an ozone layer for surface life, but the surface life evolved with one. And so therefore, if you were to remove it, the, um, co the consequences of radiation would be, would be very striking. I see. So you, you would fry all the, is it correct? Is it more complex life? Well, I mean, so we don't really know. I mean, bacteria have plenty of sunscreen compounds. Um, mm. And also, if you're a bacterium, you can live in a comfy piece of rock. So, right. so you know, you can, and that can be a sort of parasol. But if you want um, to walk around outside of a rock, then... You might want to just be covered with a lot of slime. Um, mm. That's another another possibility would be to be excreting slime all the time or to, or to have sunscreen compounds or to have a shell. Um, mm. So I, it's, it's not obvious to me that all kinds of animal life would be would be impossible but it might be quite different it might be difficult for example to maintain eyes because um eyes are quite sensitive to to ultraviolet but maybe maybe you could still perfectly well hear particularly if you were a turtle yeah. or a tortoise in a box you know you, you have this protective covering perhaps you only come out at night yeah. um so i can imagine ways that you could have life on land even if the ozone layer was not there but the important thing is to think about the context, and the context is that life is evolving in, in this place that has an ozone layer. But I suppose the energy uh, um, conversion at each step has to be relatively efficient if you want to have multiple trophic levels, right? The sort of complex ecosystems that we see. So if could we have supported, could the rock eaters have gotten to the point where they could have supported multiple trophic levels and the sort of, or do we need oxygen for that? Uh, my view is that we need oxygen. In fact, in order to have in order to have multiple levels of of things eating each other, my view mm. is that you need to have oxygen. And so, why did it take so long? You know, why is it we've got a lot of bacteria on the Earth? Why don't they? Why haven't they in the billions of years 
done this trick again why don't we have a, another type of mitochondria why don't we have a second version of the chloroplast uh, of the cyanobacteria these are deep questions um and nobody nobody has a satisfactory answer i mean the unsatisfactory answer is well that's just what happened mm. um i think it's interesting to try to think about what it might be and the one way to think about it is instead of looking back and thinking well you know why did it take four billion years for animals to appear instead you move forward and you sort of you remember that the natural selection is always happening in the prevailing circumstances mm -hmm. whatever those circumstances are and the important thing to remember is that those circumstances always include other life forms um, and that you're, you're living in conjunction with them. I, to come back to the point briefly about um, bacteria um, and trophic levels, it, actually many communities of bacteria are mostly cooperative. Mm. So they don't have predators in the way that, that you and I would think of them in general. There are a few known bacterial pr groups, but it seems to be pretty rare in mm. general. Um, and so in, in general, bacteria are living in quite a cooperative way. Now I've, now I've completely forgotten why I was Well, I can about jump this. in and ask, when, when did predation start then? <laughs> well, so predation on a large scale seems to have started with the, some of the first eukaryotic cells. There's one bacterium known to do mm -hmm. predation of the kind that you and I would think about it, that it, that it, that it hunts and engulfs other organisms. Mm -hmm. There are also some bacteria that seem to hunt in packs and then put oh. a lot of, they, they, they collectively um, put a lot of nasty chemicals into the area and these chemicals are poisons and then they then they sort of together they eat whatever it is that they've killed mm. um, but there's only one that I know of it's called Uab amorphum um, discovered off the sea uh, in the seas off Palau that is basically behaving like an amoeba even though it's very clearly bacterial yeah. um, but most predation seems to start with single-celled eukaryotes and then becomes much more of a thing uh, with animals. Is that because the they have more genetic information which allows them to be to perform more complex behaviors, or what? What is the, what is the step there? I think the first the first step in in animal evolution was was um, a certain kind of multicellularity. Um, so multicellularity has evolved on a number of occasions, as, as you remarked. It's, it's also found in some forms in bacteria and, ar and archaea sometimes. Um, but the, um, the, so the sort of what you would think of as a sort of 3D multicellularity of sort of um, where not all the cells are in contact with the medium, that seems to have happened um, six or eight times at least. Um, so a couple of times in algae, once in terrestrial plants, um, once in animals and at least twice in fungi. Um, so, in fact, if you, this is a, just a, a quick aside about multicellularity and fungi, but if you um, think about the sort of fungi that we eat, so you have things like portobello mushrooms on the one hand and something like morels on the other, they actually they have very different textures. The morel is kind mm -hmm. of squishy somehow, sort of more gelatinous. And that's because the two of them are actually very different solutions to multicellularity. So fungi seem to have managed to do it twice. Um, but in general, multicellularity um, has been relatively rare. And so, but I think this comes back to the question of if you're moving forward in time, natural selection is just doing whatever it's doing. And in order for a multicellular form to be favored by natural selection, it has to be good in comparison to everything else that's there. And maybe it's just that the circumstances in which such what, what turn out to be very dramatic changes, maybe those circumstances just um, are very rarely favorable. Mm. So I, let me give you an experiment. So there's a, there's a famous experiment in, in evolution called the long-term evolution experiment. And it was started in 1988 by a guy called Rick Lensky, and it's still ongoing. And the, it's very simple. It's you take, you have 12 flasks of E. coli, uh, so E. coli being a bacterium. Mm. And every day you take some E. coli from, yesterday, from each of yesterday's flasks and you put them into a new flask and um, then you leave them till the next day. And this has been going on now for many thousands of generations. So the medium that they're growing in is uh, limited in terms of one of the sugars that they usually eat. 
Um, but it has something else that they don't usually eat, but potentially could eat mm-hmm. in large quantity. And in each of and in all of these twelve lineages, the ability to consume this other thing has only happened once, and it took more than thirty thousand generations for it to happen. Wow. Okay. And I think what that shows is that is that very often you need you need to have mutations. And those mutations have to be favored. And in order for them to be favored, the organisms that have them have to be, um, in some respect, more effective than what is already there. And so even though there's this sort of big source of possible food, um, somehow natural selection hasn't found it 11 out of 12 times over 60,000 generations. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that just shows that there's an unpredictability, that there's a, um, that there's uh, so it's 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 stochastic, um, mm. but I think it also shows something about natural selection. The natural selection isn't looking for that sort of thing; mm. it's just dealing with whatever is there right now. Mm. And so it's easy. For, I mean, and I think this this comes back to Darwin was aware that natural selection was an imperfect term. He used it by analogy with artificial selection, which is what dog breeders do when they when they say, "Okay, well, we want a dog with long legs, or we want a dog that runs fast," or and and they take two dogs and deliberately breed them together. And when you do that, you can sometimes, in very short times, make very dramatic differences to to the animals. I mean, Darwin was particularly interested in pigeons because pigeon fancying is a thing of breeding pigeons with you know enormous enormous ruffs or uh, the, the sort of a weird thing that happens when they're flying so they sort of tum- they sort of stall in the, in mid flight and then tumble down for a while and then fly up again and and these things can be bred and they can be bred fast and so Darwin was sort of saying okay well so in in humans there's there's a there's actually an individual doing the selecting in nature there isn't um, but nevertheless, he wanted to suggest that this process could lead to big changes over time. But there is no selector. Hmm. Natural selection is actually a description of an outcome. You know, this happened, natural selection happened. Um, you know, the, the, for example, the, the finches in um, the Galapagos in the rainy season, lots of plants produce seeds that don't usually produce seeds, and birds with small beaks do very well. Then there's a drought, and only birds with big beaks do very well. But it's again, so so natural selection. If, so there was a nice study um, done by the Grants on Galapagos finches that showed that if you looked at point A and 30 years later at point B, it seemed like beak, beak size hadn't changed. But if you actually looked each year, as they had done, they showed sort of fantastic fluctuations. So in one year, big beaks were really were really important, and another year, small beaks were important, and and so you you just kind of see that often. Natural selection is kind of gusting around, mm. and and the net effect over time is for apparently nothing much to happen, mm. um, and I think that that's very often the way that it is, and mm. so that's one of the things that explains why we have these very long spans of time without much going on. In some sense, it's it sort of highlights how wasteful the whole process is, right? Just so before we get away from predation on this point, I will have a question just to get some idea of your personality. Uh oh. <laughs> Dude, when you look at predation and and, and when you look at uh, the march of evolution, do you see it as sort of some beautiful dance or uh, some beautiful natural phenom- phenomenon, or do you see it as being because a, a lot of animals have to die to produce the the organisms that we are today? Do, do you do you see it in some sense as this massive atrocity? <laughs> I see it as both. I, I, I see it as absolutely appalling and really disturbing and, and just so upsetting in one way. And in another way, that's, that's what allows us to have the beauty and the wonder. Mm. It's, it's, it's this, this, I mean, I really, think, I really think it's terrible. I mean, I think that to hunt and kill, there's something truly awful about it. It's, it's, it's revolting. Mm. And, and yet, that has, that has produced so much astonishment Mm. and and so i i try to just kind of hold these two things 
simultaneously because you know i i i find i mean i, I darwin called animals you know the, the most astonishing thing that the human mind could conceive of and i and i agree with him i think i think that they are um you know i mean there's so much variety and 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 agility and speed and cunning and and all of these astonishing traits and yet the purpose is death It's horrifying, <laughs> but it, it leads to the the diversity and then the joy and the wonderful things that we see in life. So, well, I think that one of the so there was a um, one of the questions is why are there so many kinds of plankton? This was mm-hmm. asked by a guy called uh, Hutchinson in the fifties, and essentially because you know it's okay so there's a certain amount of variation in how much light you receive depending on how deep you are mm-hmm. in the in the sea but there's there's far more variation in algae than you would expect just on the basis of light levels and animals are certainly sustaining that variation to some extent so for example why do cyanobacteria have this shell well maybe it's something to do with just their photosynthesis and their use of carbon dioxide or maybe it's because it actually protects them from something, mm-hmm. um, and and so so you know it, it's it really hugely increases the diversity of the world. Mm. Something else that really increases the diversity of the world. Uh, another in, when we're talking about the uh, innovations that life has gone through, sex. So, how did sex begin, and how was it invented? So, again, nobody knows how sex began. And I should say straight away that biologists are pretty loose in their use of the word sex. And so it it is loosely used to apply to a lot of different phenomena. It could apply to copulation, for example. Um, But it could also apply to some things that bacteria do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say that that's misleading, but yeah. that and that when most biologists talk about sex, what they're really talking about is a process of dividing up the cell nucleus called meiosis. Mm-hmm. And um, meiosis appears to have started with um, the first eukaryotes. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows how. Um, if you're wondering what meiosis is, it's that you you do it. It's the way that um, sperm cells are produced. It's the way that egg cells are produced. And the idea is in a, um, an animal like a human, the idea is that most of the time each of your cells has two copies of your genes, one from your mother and one from your father. And what happens during meiosis is that those get distributed to the next generation. But the peculiar thing about it is you would expect, okay, you have one cell with two copies, you just divide up that cell and each cell just gets one copy. But that's not what happens. You double the number and then divide in four. Mm. And that's somewhat perplexing. Um, nobody has a good answer for how meiosis started. However, once it starts, so take it as a given that it did start, then a whole cascade of other things become possible. So once you have, um, once you have meiosis, then you have the possibility of evolving sexes. Um, and by sexes here, I'm going to mean um, organisms that in order to reproduce you need to be with an organism that is different from you in this mm-hmm. in the same sex or sorry is different from you in sex mm-hmm. um and but a lot of a lot of uh single-celled eukaryotes for example will they don't make eggs and sperm everybody makes cells the same size um and but there's often mating types so you know yes okay we're both making cells the same size but well we still can't mate together because we're the same mating type and we need to find a different mating type Mm -hmm. Uh, that would be one possibility another possibility would be um that you don't you don't actually make separate cells that instead you you do this process of meiosis internally you divide up the nucleus and then you swap um so that happens in fungi And it also happens in ciliates. The most popular ciliate is paramecium, which people tend to study at school. It's a sort of slipper-shaped thing. It's single-celled. It's a eukaryote. And sex in ciliates is extremely weird. So bacteria grow and divide and grow and divide. And then if they collect extra genes from somewhere, which is what biologists would say sex was for bacteria, um, they do it during their lifetime. Mm-hmm. And then they incorporate those genes and do whatever they do and grow. They and absorb bite. them from the environment, or, or from each other, mm-hmm. or from a virus, or whatever. I mean, they're pretty, uh, pretty pretty um, loose. 
Yeah. 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 Um, but eukaryotes are, are a bit more disciplined about this. But the thing that's peculiar about a ciliate is that it will grow and divide and grow and divide. But when it wants to, when it wants to do meiosis, it doesn't reproduce. Instead, it just swaps. Uh, it just swaps um, a nucleus with a sort of a haploid nucleus with somebody. So wait, wait, they, they, they swap nucleus with each other. Yes, ha- it, the nucleus leaves the cell or the the membrane. The nucleus mm. travels from one to they, and they go. It's bidirectional. So you trade. It's very, very weird. Okay. Ciliates are extremely weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, once you once so once you have once you have sex in this form of meiosis, you have you have the possibility of sexes. Mm-hmm. Once you have sexes, you have the possibility of being separate sexes or being both at once. Mm-hmm. You have the possibility of changing sex in the course of your life, which many fish do. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then of course you have the whole question of how to find. Uh, and seduce a mate. And so that also produces um, much of the variety that we find appealing in nature. You know, birdsong, flowers, um, you know, basically every, every fantastic display, it's, it's, all about, it's all about seduction and, and, and sex. But then so how weird and alien can sex get? <laughs> what, what, I mean, it's a pretty big question. Uh, <laughs> You've mentioned a few, but what are some other possibilities that we think of copulation, right? But- we do think of copulation, and we also tend to think that you know. So, the, in banana slugs, for example, mm. uh, which are large yellow slugs that live off the coast of California, or, well, along the along the coast, they're not marine; they're on land. Um, banana slugs are hermaphrodites, um, but sometimes their penis gets stuck, and then they just bite it off. <laughs> so um, that's and then they're a female from that point on then they yeah. behave as a female from that point on yeah so in the traditional categories what makes what makes something male and what makes something female so a biologist would define um that the male is making sperm and the female is making eggs but the and the sperm are smaller than eggs so so for example um things can get very complicated so seahorses for example the female makes eggs but she um, has a phallus like structure which she uses to deposit her eggs inside the pouch of the male and he fertilizes them there and then has a pregnancy does he have like one sperm because ah that is a that is a very interesting question so um there is a phenomenon called sperm competition Mm. and sperm competition is happens when a female has sex with several males and the sperm then compete to fertilize her eggs. Now, if sperm com- competition proceeds according to a raffle, so that the more tickets you buy, the more likely you are to win, you might expect that there would be a rough relationship between level of promiscuity on the part mm-hmm. of females and the production of sperm on the part of males. And that is broadly correct. So mm-hmm. when you look at uh, males are different species, and you look at their testes. Um, those with very large testes in proportion to their bodies, like chimpanzees, uh, have uh, tend to have um, very promiscuous females. Hmm. Um, the seahorse is one of the very few groups where there can be no sperm competition. And although not very many male seahorses have had their sperm counted, those that have turn out to be making more or less one sperm per egg. When, and of course, this is interesting, right? Because a human male, when, when a human male ejaculates, it tends to be many hundreds of millions of sperm. Um, and um, sometimes not, as, not quite as many as that, but it's still a lot. And, but this, this seahorse is just making, you know, essentially one sperm per egg. And that, that shows it's in that respect, it's, it's much less of a wasteful process. But to come back to the gender roles, if you were defining a female as the one who does all the work, then you would define the male seahorse as a female because he's the one who's having the pregnancy. But so this I don't really understand. Is it because so so the distinction that I don't really understand is it because the gametes take a particular form? Like what 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 is it about the male seahorse that makes us say that's the male? What what why do we why do we if he behaves in every way that we conceive, say human female would? Um, why do we label why why does he get that label because the the uh he's making sperm and sperm are smaller than eggs 
Okay, so it's the, the size of the, the okay. It's 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 essentially a measure of investment, roughly. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, a, a female blue crab will make many millions of eggs. I mean, eggs are not necessarily very very expensive if you're a female blue crab, but but it's it's more of a kind of it's a it's just a sense that there is there is an asymmetry, and that mm. that asymmetry sometimes has interesting consequences. From looking at the form of other animals can you so you mentioned well, let me just go directly to the question can you tell anything about how natural for example mon- monogamy is in humans from the form of a human compared to other animals that act in a monogamous fashion uh so what you can say is that um compared to gorillas on the one hand and chimpanzees on the other humans are sort of in the middle, mm-hmm. but more towards the gorilla end of things. So if you look at a chimpanzee, a male chimpanzee is not particularly big himself, but his testicles are like grapefruits. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you look at a gorilla, he's obviously pretty hulking and enormous, but his testicles are more like peanuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and that, and that reflects the fact that although female gorillas can sometimes change harem, they tend to live in a harem with and tend in general to mate with the one male whose harem it is. Um, humans are not nearly as extreme as gorillas, um, but they're also not nearly as extreme as chimpanzees either. It's very difficult to know for sure what humans are actually up to. It's controversial, it's hard to study, and people tend to get a bit hostile about it. Um, but I think what one could say is that humans are probably mostly monogamous. Mm-hmm. It obviously changes a bit in time and space, and there are, there are different sexual patterns and preferences at different, in, you know, that are culturally acceptable or not acceptable. But it, it seems like the, there's, there doesn't seem, it's not tremendously competitive environment for human males, often. So what is it that sex gives a species? So, so what is the benefit? To, is it necessary to have a large more complex genome because it gives you access to more DNA. What is the, what is it that sex gives us in benefit? So this is a, this is a, this is something that I looked at a bit when I was doing my PhD. Um, and again, there's, there's no agreed on answer, Mm -hmm. but there are a number of different types of answers. So sex tends to have a number of different consequences. As I said, it's a complex process. It, you do two cell divisions and then, a, and then you divide by four and get four cells out. Um, and during that, a lot of different things go on. And one of the things that goes on is DNA repair. So that you, if a chromosome is broken, you fix it. If there's a mistake here, you repair that. Um, obviously it's not perfect, but it's, it's, uh, it's part of the process. Um, but you also get a, a shuffling of uh of dna so so if you if you think about you know you you inherit dna from both your parents and you so you're not identical to either of them mm. um and there are certainly circumstances in which both of those processes are useful mm-hmm. um the the variation uh idea the sort of shuffling idea suggests that you, if if everybody's genetically identical then if a disease comes through that is dangerous, it kills everybody. And we certainly see that in agriculture sometimes because we've created these enormous monocultures. Bananas being there. Bananas, but by no means only bananas. Um, and and so, so you can, you know, you can potentially lose everything. I mean, mm. agriculture, the thing, the thing is that it's, it's a double-edged thing. Agriculture likes monocultures because it's, you're getting something that's more or less predictable. So apples, for example, are usually grown from, from they're usually clones in the sense mm-hmm. that, you, that you grow, if, if you just plant an apple seed, you don't get anything like the parent necessarily. If you have an apple that you like eating, what you want to do is take part of the tree that you like to eat and graft it onto something else and continue to grow a new tree. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so, and so, you know, sex, cha- it, it creates change. And um, some people say that this allows natural selection to be more efficient. Um, Some people say it allows resistance to pests. Maybe it's the same thing. And then other people focus on DNA repair. But basically, there's just, there's potentially lots of advantages for some organisms some of the time. Now, if you look at small organisms, uh, you discover that many of them have a capacity to do either. 
And if they have a capacity to do either, then they tend, for example, if you take an aphid, which you may, if you grow tomatoes, you may be familiar with aphids, that little... little uh, There's the ones that the ants farm, right? An some ants farm some aphids. Um, there's a huge variety of aphids, but many aphid females can be asexual all summer and then will um, become sexual at the end of the summer. Um, and, and that is a quite a common possibility that you will that when the times are good you just keep on reproducing asexually partly because it's much faster um but then at the end of the season you have a great bout of sex and create diversity for the new conditions of next year what is it about smaller animals so the picture that you're painting in my mind is that there's some threshold below which um asexual reproduction is more beneficial and you, you pass some threshold of then for larger animals in general, uh, sexual reproduction is preferred. Uh, but of course, then there's snakes and some reptiles that are quite large and fish that can do it as well. Is that is that the image that, for, that there is some sort of a threshold that you can sort of predict in some sense? Well, I mean, I think it may, I mean, I, I don't, there are certainly some rules of thumb that you can use, but I don't know that evolution had to arrive at those rules of thumb, if you see what I mean. So I can imagine, so it, it is the case that, that mammals require sexual reproduction mm -hmm. and birds do as well. Um, but whether it would have been possible for that, for an asexual capacity to have remained, um, I don't know. I mean, it just, it didn't happen that way. Did, was that necessary? I'm not sure. Um, and and so you, I mean, plants are an interesting example because a lot of plants can do both and do both. So they send out runners, but they also make flowers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so so I don't think it has. I mean, it's the way it is. I'm not sure it's the way it had to be. Hmm. Is sex a battle? Right. We talk about the the battle of the sexes, right? Um, my conception is that within a species, the species itself wants to be successful, right? But uh, then we talk about the battle of the sexes. So is there some sort of vying back and forth where males are trying to distribute their genes at the expense of the females in the population and so on? Well, so first I want to come back to the first part of what you just said there, because the idea that... that a species wants to perpetuate is very common, but I think it's false. So I think that individuals very often want to propagate their genes, or at least behave in such a way that they do, whether they wish to or not. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that a tawny owl is th sitting there thinking, having great thoughts of his or her genes, but the fact is that there comes a time of year and they feel in a certain sort of mood and then they, they try to find a, another tawny owl and they, and they make eggs. Um, so, but I, but I think that it's, it's much less obvious that there's a sort of species drive. Humans like to think about, oh, we must perpetuate the species. Um, I don't actually think that's the way it usually works. I think that species are perpetuated because of the sex drive, but I don't think that it's, it's uh, something that is intrinsically desired mm -hmm. by individuals of the species or that is actually the outcome. I mean, species often go extinct, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if you define a species as, um, as a group of organisms that can potentially reproduce viable offspring and viable and fertile offspring, which is the biological species definition. It's a little bit crude because there are plenty of, um, there are plenty of, of lineages that, that have been separated geographically for a long time, but if you bring them close together, they can actually interbreed, but we consider them to be separate species because usually they don't. Um, so ducks, for example, there are plenty of ducks that if you if you bring a duck from Argentina to um, Europe, it'll probably be able to mate with European ducks, or some of them will be able to, but usually they don't. So we effectively they can't. If practically they, yeah, usually practically they can't. But anyway, um, just because there's a sort of blur, blurring around the edges, let's say a biological species is is um, a, a mating pool essentially. Um, then what is interesting about this is that the interests of males and females may not be the same, but the genes, almost all of the genes will spend time in 
members of either sex over time. So for example, um, let's say you have children, some of them will might be male, but some of them might be female. So your, the genes that, that are yours will still sometimes be, fine, be spending time in females. Um, and so this creates a sort of weird tension. Uh, and one of the things that sometimes happens is that, is that some genes end up on sex chromosomes. Uh, and then, for example, in humans, the males generally have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, and females generally have two X chromosomes. And um, potentially, some things might end up on the Y chromosome that are very specific to males, because mm -hmm. it's never going to turn up in a female. Mm -hmm. But th that system of sex chromosomes, by the way, is, is, is very evolutionarily labile. So there are plenty of mm -hmm. other sex, chromosomes arra sex chromosome arrangements. And so, for example, in birds, it's females that have uh, um, a Z and a W, okay. and males have two Zs. Fruit flies are like humans, um, but butterflies are like birds. And at the same time, also, you have, you have some species where the male is X nothing. Um, so there's no special chromosome for the male. There's also systems where the male only has one set of genes instead of the usual two. Um, so in a lot of uh, in a lot of insects, for example, the the male hatches from an unfertilized egg, which leads to strange practices of incest sometimes, uh, because a, a mother who has not found a mate can lay an egg which is unfertilized. It will hatch a male, and then oh, she can have sex with her son. The, I see. Oh, she will have sex. I, I thought you were going to say the daughters and sons would. That can happen sometimes, but she can also just have sex with her son. Um, and then that works. That that that, that produces fertile. It does partly because because the male is haploid. If he's so, the normal reason that in severe inbreeding is thought to be harmful is because um, each of us carries some genes that are invisibly bad for us. But if there are two copies, if you get one from each of your parents, then 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 you are missing a function, and sometimes it's it's lethal, or sometimes you're just very ill, whatever it is. But because the male is hatching from an unfertilized egg, all of his genes are exposed to selection. Mm -hmm. So all of his, you know, if he has something that makes him inviable, that's it for him. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you have very, you have a lot of fluidity in the possibilities of how males and females uh, are sustained, even though males and females are uh, found in many different species. But to come back to the question of the battle of the sexes, there are times when females are going to want to have sex with more than one male, but the male will wish to prevent it, um, perhaps. There are also times when the reverse might be true, uh, and and so you you can certainly you can certainly see potential for conflict, and sometimes even when you look at genes, you can actually see actual genetic conflict. We don't necessarily. Sorry, what do you mean by that? Well, what what, you, what I mean is that there are experiments where you let's say you you manage to you do fancy genetic experiments that allow the that keep the females as they are, but allow the males to to evolve to become sort of super lovers. Okay. Um, what, is, what does that or, or mean? Let me, let me put it differently. Let's, let, an easier example would be, would be let's say that you have, um, let's say that you have flies. Mm -hmm. And let's say they're yellow dung flies. So they live on cow pads. And let's say that you force monogamy. So mm -hmm. you, you take a male and a female, and that's the, that's the only mate available to each of them. And you have them like that for, let's say, 25 generations. Mm -hmm. And then you have a different group where, where, let's say, the female is promiscuous. Um, so there's one female and three males. Let's you, say. you put the different males into their container. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then she has offspring, and then you repeat this this mm -hmm. thing. Um, what you find is that over time, first of all, in the monogamous group, um, the male's testes get smaller and smaller because he doesn't have any sperm competition, and sperm are expensive to make. Mm -hmm. But then, that also in the promiscuous group, um, if you if you introduce males from the promiscuous group to the monogamous females, the monogamous females are sort of overwhelmed. I mean, they, <laughs> they, 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 they... This is what you mean by a super breeder? Or? Yeah, so, okay. well, not a super breeder, a super, a super seducer. Super seducer. <laughs> so, so it seems that there is often a, a conflict between the sexes, but the peculiar thing is that it's happening within the same general set of genes. Mm. Um, and I think that's part of what makes it interesting. So are there any examples where 
I suppose in insects and, and spiders in particular, the females e- eat the males on occasion, right? Are there any other examples that are less well known where one of the genders or one of the sexes rather acts in a way which is really to the detriment of the other? Well, I mean, the eating of the male in spiders is not necessarily detrimental to the male. Um, by which He might uh, feel otherwise. He might do, but on the other hand, I mean, if you take the Australian redback spider, for example, which is related to the black widow, um, only 13% of males ever encounter a female. Mm. So to have encountered a female at all is is a triumph. Mm. And in fact, in the Australian redback spider, if she starts eating you, uh, you actually have sex for longer. And you, so you transfer more sperm and you have more reproductive success. So it's not always... I mean, the thing that's terrible for the male is that if he, if he gets eaten before sex. And that, <laughs> and that happens sometimes. You know, in praying mantises, famously, the male is sort of sneaking up behind the female playing grandmother's footsteps. And if she turns around and catches him um, before he's managed to get into position, then then that's too bad for him. But you can imagine that evolving almost as a test as well. I mean, if all the other females are trying to catch and eat their, their mates, then you're, then any of your sons are going to be faced with this problem as well. And so you, you might expect a sort of rather macabre, um, you know, the evolution of a macabre kind of mm-hmm. uh, exam um, where, you have to be, where the male has to be nimble enough to evade all of these problems. But there's the reverse, right? So as a female, you would like to find a mate who is nimble enough to escape you. And for the male, you would like to find a female who you can't escape? Is that? Um, no, I think you still want to escape. I think, I think male praying mantises do not wish to be eaten before sex. Right, but as long as you can procreate, you, you probably want to do it with the female who is as aggressive and quick as possible. Possibly, right? yeah. Possibly. Even though that limits the chances that you'll mate with another female within within your lifetime i think it depends a bit on what your future reproductive chances are mm-hmm. you know i think i mean there are some so spiders one of the things that happens in spiders is that is that females um they often don't move around much they're sitting on their web mm-hmm. and so from the male's point of view the problem is to just find somebody mm-hmm. uh it's not true for all spiders but it's true for some of them um and and so then um if if the prospects of remating are very low, then let's assume that the male doesn't mind very much in the grand scheme of things. Um, whereas if if surviving the mating meant that you might be able to go on and have several more, then I think you'd be more likely to resist. Hmm. Um, so you started, I don't know if you started your career in this direction, but you're perhaps best well known for Dr. Tatiana's uh, sex advice to all creation, right? So you, you were initially interested in uh, sex, and then you moved on to rocks and the rock eaters and the e- energy. Um, I don't. I know you don't want to say epochs, but energy epochs. How did you make that transition? Yes, well, I sort of think it's all gone wrong. You know, I used to think about sex, and now I think about rocks, and oh no. Um, but essentially, I just became fascinated by the transformation of the Earth, uh, and I, I suppose. Ultimately, I wanted to know what it meant to be alive here and now, roughly 4.5 billion years into Earth history. And I realized that in order to understand that, I had to understand something about the nature of the Earth. And as I started to look into that, I discovered that the nature of the Earth is today something that has, to a really astonishing extent, been created by the activities of life forms. And so this, for me... It, it, it gave me a, a feeling of connection to not just the other life forms, but also to the rocks and the water mm-hmm. and, the, and the air and the sky. I see. So it, it gave you more of a holistic. Very much so. I mean, it, it's, it gave me, it, I mean, it's in some ways, it's a sort of mad folly of a project um, mm-hmm. because, because the history of Earth is so long and because the... Um, the variety of disciplines that ideally one would master in order mm. to understand earth history deeply are so varied and many. Um, but 
it has so there have been many times when I've when I've been thinking about the histories of life on earth there have been many times when I have fa- felt overwhelmed by the material because you know there are so many scientists there's so many papers you know I could read a new you know I could read a new paper every day for the next thousand years and not have exhausted the literature I mean it's just enormous and part of the challenge is saying okay I can't read anymore mm. I have to just take what I've got and work with it um, but but it's I have never become bored with the subject mm. it, it just has fascinated me uh, even even questions about you know so 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 I you know I sort of find myself going to visit the rock collections and natural history museums which previously I had never really bothered to do mm. and but it's also I I sort of I, I just see the whole world differently. I suppose I, I had never appreciated the extent to which the world around us is sculpted by biology uh, before I started reading your article that you sent me. Uh, back to the example of the worm, right? Where, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, worms are responsible for turning over immense amounts of soil and it, it's through these processes that we have the burial of old buildings uh, and all sorts of, uh, you know, the subsidence of hills. Um, I, I hadn't really appreciated how much it was biology rather than tectonic plates moving that shape uh, what we see around us. Well, obviously, tectonic plates are playing a role, mm. um, but but biology... But I mean, not but the sole role. Not by no means the sole role. Mm. Um, and, I mean, there are some scientists who have argued that actually tectonic plates are also partly helped by mm. life. I don't understand the arguments well enough to adjudicate, but the um, but certainly, I mean, to go back to the, to take the earthworm point, I mean, so that was something that Darwin was looking at uh, towards the end of his life, at least it seems towards the end of his life, because in uh, six months before he died, he he published um, a book about earthworms. But actually, it was a project that he'd been working on for more than thirty years. And he was the first person to try to quantify the scale of changes um, that earthworms produce. But the thing that's astonishing, so he, he, he weighs the soil and he measures it and he, and he shows that, that worms bring up, they, they bring up soil from down below, they, they transform leaves into soil, they, they also they grind soil and they sift it and, and, and completely change its quality. But the thing that's astonishing is that, is that worms are only one small part of that story and that in the tropics a lot of this is done by ants um, and in the water you also have a tremendous um, turnover of of, uh, of sediments by life forms you have ox- o- oxygen is brought into sediments because of burrowing organisms and when you add up the sort of the, the total effect of burrowing organisms it, it's just astonishing you know it's even you know it's just think of a few that you could name it's moles and badgers and wombats and um and even i mean kingfishers when they nest they build burrows and out there is a burrowing owl um and and just this this constant churning of of the world mm. um which is you know in particular the earthworm most people you know after the after their sort of too big to, you know, I remember when I was two years old, I was fascinated by earthworms, but you know, you, you grow up and earthworms are sort of down there and, and mm. you don't really, you don't really notice them. But one of Darwin's strengths was that he took interest in, in everything. Mm. Yeah. And sculpted them into a massive story. <laughs> but, so, a, but a true story, you know, yeah, it's, it's, I, I, it, it's right. you know, it's, 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 it's real what he found. He pulled together bits of information from all over the planet. Yeah. And and uh, and actually, what I said before that I, I found his coral book a bit dull, but I, mm. I think the earthworm book is a tour de force. It's a triumph. It's one you'd recommend. Yeah, What's it called? Uh, it's called The Formation of Vegetable Mold. I think from your article, it was a real hit when it came out, right? It was a hit when it came out, yes. I mean, by then he was also a well-known figure, mm. um, but it was a hit when, he came, when it came out. So let's jump back into the inventions, the innovations. So DNA, how much of an innovation of, is this? In other words, how, how much is, was the, uh, is the structure of DNA directed to through evolution as opposed to it was just chemically what there was? So nobody knows how DNA formed in the beginning. 
Uh, it's a very stable molecule. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, I think there are different aspects of the question. Um, whether it was originally formed um, as a result of chemical interactions or whether it, whether it is itself the outcome of natural selection in some way, I think is not very clear. Um, everything has DNA. And so we can't really compare it to something else. Uh, there are people who've, who've, I mean, there is certainly more than one kind of nucleic acid. There's DNA and there's RNA. And then within that, there are, you know, there are, so if you, if you think about the, the DNA, it's the double helix. It's a sort of set of banisters and some steps, if you think about it in sort of crudely. And the steps are made of, um, they're called bases. Mm -hmm. And DNA has four. RNA also has four, but the four in RNA are not quite the same. There's three out of four are the same. But there's many other possible bases. And so I think one of the questions is, could you have imagined a molecule that had the same properties as DNA, but made of different bases? And that's something that you can look at to some extent in a lab. Um, but I don't know what the current feeling is about it. And I also think that doing it in a lab is not the same as it being successful in the wild. Mm. Uh, it may be that there are things that we can't measure easily that are important about the actual DNA we have that would discriminate against sort of rival DNAs um, that were created with different bases. But, but nobody, I don't think, knows. It's one of the, it's one of the mysteries. Okay. So the benefit of DNA over RNA, as far as I understand, is that it's more stable, right? Do we have pure RNA animals or organisms? Um, RNA and DNA occur in all life forms. If you th think about viruses, they mm. are either DNA or RNA. They're never both. I didn't know that. Um, mm. Viruses are... Um, Viruses are a bit strange in the sense that some people categorize them as alive, some people don't. I used to categorize them as alive. I don't anymore. Why is that? Uh, because they don't have any metabolism. I see. And, um, but one of the characteristics, there, so there are many different kinds of viruses. There are viruses that are DNA, there are viruses that are RNA, there are viruses within RNA viruses, there are single-stranded viruses, there are double-stranded viruses. Um, it, DNA, I think, is the same, actually. I think there are also double-stranded, single-stranded DNA viruses. I mean, there's, I might be wrong about that, I can't remember, but there's, there's an absolutely enormous diversity. Mm -hmm. But unlike organisms, which all seem to be part of the same tree of life, Viruses appear to have evolved several different times, but nobody knows exactly when or how. I mean... But they're still seen to have a common ancestor? No. Or no. no, they're not seen to have a common ancestor. So, so is that an indication that life may have started multiple times via a virus sort of pathway? Or no. No. No, it, I don't think there's, there's no debate about life having started more than once. And why is that? Um, what's, what's the argument there? Uh, basically, the, the unity of biochemistry. So it's everything has DNA, everything has RNA. The DNA is, is read in the same way. So, so if, I put, if I put a gene from a jellyfish into a bacterium, that gene will behave in the bacterium in the way that it did in a jellyfish, which is mm -hmm. to say that a gene encodes um, a protein. And so if I put protein X from a jellyfish into the bacterium, bacteria will make protein X. Um, and, and, and that's not by, by no means the only unity of biochemistry. There's many, there, there are many, many others. And this was noticed long before the structure of DNA was discovered and long before it was clear that DNA was the molecule of inheritance. There were people, uh, bacteriology people, microbiology people who were basically saying it's all the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, su that suggests either that it's extremely deterministic or that everything is descended from one ancestor. Mm -hmm. Which was, I suppose, my original question, right? Is, was it the DNA directed by the chemistry or was it evolved to? Yeah. I think it's probably going to be both. I mean, I think it starts out as chemistry and then maybe if there are alternatives and the alternatives are not as good as DNA, then, then this is the one that becomes selected. One of the things that I find quite interesting about DNA is that 
we have these small mutations which give rise to, I suppose, evolution ultimately, um, where you end up with a functional animal. Right? If you think of the way that computer code works, if you change a few zeros and ones, you often end up with something that doesn't work at all. So what is it? What is it about DNA that allows this sort of uh, mutation and evolution to occur? Well, so a mutation is a is a profound subject, and there are there are mutations that have no effect that we can detect. Uh, there are mutations that have very subtle effects. There are mutations that are very small changes in DNA, but very big changes in what you look like. So, for example, there's, um, I don't know if you saw, but there's recently been a, a spotless giraffe born in a zoo in Tennessee. It's rather mm. elegant. It's, mm. uh, it's uh, sort of reddish brown mm. all over. Um, now, the spotless giraffe is what would historically have been called a sport of nature. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what the genetic basis of that change is, but it's my guess that it's a very small genetic change. Um, but you can also have large genetic changes like chromosomes fusing together or losing a bit of a chromosome. And sometimes they don't make that much detectable difference. So, so you can have, you can have mut- mutations that, have, that are very small in terms of the change to DNA, but have very big effects in terms of the organism. Um, or, you can, or you can have mutations that make no difference that we can discern. Um, you know, for this sport of nature, we don't know whether if she was in the wild and not a zoo, we don't know whether she would be able to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if it's true that, that the spots on a giraffe are part of a, a camouflage of sort of breaking the pattern, mm-hmm. um, then maybe she's a sort of big block of color and she's visible. I find it a little hard to believe, actually, because giraffes are so obvious, they're so tall. I mean, I've, I've never sort of not noticed a giraffe, but maybe the ones I didn't notice were the ones that were particularly camouflaged. I don't know. but um, I guess the thing I'm, I, I want to understand better is whether the fact that evolution works at all is that in some sense d- does that point to the fact that dna functions very differently to the way that computer code functions right as a child i had this conception that there were there were routines that were running in the background that eventually would one day be able to translate into something that looked very much like computer code it, but i don't think that's the way that dna works right it, it's it's more analogous to say a neural network or something along these lines where you have this huge parameter space uh, do, do we have any idea so making analogies of that kind is not something that i would feel very comfortable with because i don't um i don't work with computer code so i don't mm-hmm. have a good or, or neural nets so i don't have a good sense of it but what i do have a sense of is that is that there's um there's a lot of uh i think I think that the important thing to remember about biology is that there is a huge amount of death. Hmm. And we don't see that necessarily, but there is a huge amount of death. So there's a lot of mutations that just don't Hmm. work. And then we don't see them because the organism that had them died. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's also, you know, I mean, there are some bacteria that, that grow and divide and grow and divide and grow and divide every 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, in within about three days, you'd have a mass of bacteria, the, the, the mass of the earth, mm-hmm. because of the potential of exponential growth. So assuming no death, you would, you, everybody just grow and divide. You would, you would have an absolutely enormous number. So you can, obviously that doesn't happen because there's some, there's some reason that, that you know, there's always, there's always a limit to resources or energy. There's always something that, that organisms run out of so they can't grow indefinitely or they get eaten or whatever it is. But... But there's, so there's always a limit, but the, um, the potential for enormous numbers very fast, like Prochlorococcus, 10 to the 27th. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you, if you have a 10 to the, population of 10 to the 27th, you're sampling, I mean, your genome is probably only, you know, let, let, I don't know how big it is, but let's say, let's be generous. Let's say it's a, a I don't know, 20,000 base pairs. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, or 20,000, you know, 20,000 genes would be huge for bacterium, but let's, uh, let's say it's whatever it is, but, but the number of organisms is far, far bigger. So mm-hmm. you, you, can, you can sample every single point change to DNA all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's the biggest difference. It's not so much that it's, that you can change things willy nilly. Mm-hmm. It's more that, that you have so much opportunity to try. Mm-hmm. So in, a, in some sense, I have a selection bias 
which I might be mistaken for information about the form of, of the code. To some extent, I think. Yeah, mm. to some extent. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so we've talked about different technologies and you pointed out uh, cyanobacteria, sort of this... Um, what, what, different, what, different innovations. Innova- different innovations. But So people call this the great oxidation event or the um, oxygen apocalypse. Um, what do you think were the key filters that we got through to get to humans and, and sort of the, the, comple- the more complex life um, that we are? So first of all, I just want to demolish the idea of an oxygen holocaust. There's no evidence that that ever happened. Can you paint the picture of what the story is? Because this is, this is still a, a nice picture, right? So the idea is that oxygen began to accumulate. Oxygen was toxic to a lot of organisms, which indeed it is. Um, and there was a mass extinction of bacteria. There is no evidence that that happened, and there is no reason to think it could have happened. For the simple reason... Is it still held, though? Do people still push this argument? Uh, you hear it here and there, but I, it was brought into vogue in the 1980s, basically around the time that the Great Oxidation event became established as, a, as something that had clearly happened. There were people already, you know, in the 1840s and 1850s who were imagining a time when the Earth had had no mm. atmospheric oxygen. And there was somebody in the 1920s who produced pretty good evidence that Earth had had mm. no oxygen for a large part of its history. But the, the fact of the Great Oxidation and the timing of it became established much more recently. And when that became established, there were some people who started to say, oh my goodness, oxygen is so poisonous for so many organisms, which is true. Um, there are some organisms that you know can't, can't be exposed to, to very much before. There are a lot of bacteria that, that require a lack of oxygen. Um, and so it was hypothesized that this, that this would have been terrible. But I think the fact is that that Holocaust, that mass extinction of bacteria did not happen. And the reason I would say so is that there are many bacteria alive and well today that cannot tolerate oxygen, and many of them are living in your gut. And so there are plenty of places, you know, even just a few millimeters below the surface. Mm -hmm. If you're living, let's say you're living with cyanobacteria, so cyanobacteria producing oxygen, and you're living in a complex community of bacteria. Two millimeters below the layer of cyanobacteria, you have things that requ- that require an absence of oxygen. But because everything around them is already either the oxygen has bubbled off or the other organisms around them have already consumed it, they are perfectly fine. Mm. And and so you can live in great proximity to oxygen-producing organisms while being poisoned by oxygen yourself. If in your little environment there isn't mm. any, and so I think that this is the point. The point is that okay. There's oxygen present now in abundances where it wasn't present before, but there are still plenty of places to live Hmm. where oxygen is is absent and and there's no crisis. Hmm. But let's say you rolled the dice a thousand times. You've got a thousand Earths, 10,000 Earths, a million Earths. What percentage of the time do you get to something that looks like cyanobacteria? What percentage of the time do you get monkey-like things? What, what, What are the... What should have happened on our Earth? And were, were we lucky to end up here or was it sort of an inevitability? Oh, I don't think there's anything inevitable about us. Um, I, I think that, um, but I also don't think ending up here, ending up here makes, makes it look like we arrived here from outer space. We, we evolved You don't here. believe in panspermia? Well, as I think that's an entirely so. Okay, so there are several different things going on here. Panspermia. Mm. Panspermia is the idea that um, life starts not intrinsically to the Earth, but by arriving here from somewhere else. Mm. Nobody thinks that what life that even if even the proponents of panspermia, and I'm not among them, <laughs> but even the proponents of panspermia think that that life that was transferred was bacterial and archaeal. They don't mm. think that it was humans. Mm. Um, they don't think, I mean, rather strangely, one of the people who did suggest that actually, well, he suggested it was a bit strange. Um, Francis Crick, who mm-hmm. was famous for the discovery of the structure of DNA, he had a sort of weird idea that there were aliens going around sort of seeding planets. <laughs> 
So it was kind of a directed panspermia. But the basic idea is, let's say, let's say that actually Mars formed earlier than Earth and got mm-hmm. going with some kind of life form, and then a meteorite lands and and splits out a bit of Mars and. The, the rock travels here and carries bacteria with it. and This is happening, right? This is... There is an exchange. And I think from memory, it is from Mars towards Earth. Uh, it's probably both directions, but Earth has larger gravity, so it'd be more difficult. Hmm. Um, so, so you certainly... Exp- uh, there is more likely to be more of Mars will arrive here. The than escape than velocity of Mars is lower than right. Um, there's also plenty of Earth on the moon. Um, mm. And in fact, I think it would be very interesting to explore the moon very thoroughly to look for very old Earth rocks. Mm-hmm. Because because Earth Earth is a very active planet. It has volcanoes and, and plate tectonics and, and, uh, and that overwrites the history of the Earth. It's one of the problems with understanding the origin of life is that it's not that it's not that... Um, I mean, basically, the evidence has just disappeared. Mm-hmm. There's there's nothing really, mm-hmm. um, and and so and so I think it would be interesting to explore the moon and try to see whether there's mm-hmm. something there because the moon is much more quiet. Hasn't been buried by worms or hasn't been buried by worms. Hasn't been destroyed by 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 the acti- by the roots of plants. Hasn't been mm-hmm. just it, it's by the chemistry that's going on. Yeah. yeah, by the water, by the you know. So it's quite likely that there are ancient rocks uh, on the moon, and I think that that would be very interesting to to know. But to come back to to so I I do think that there's a general trend mm. in the evolution of life, and I think that that trend is towards. I, I think that you could expect that. A planet. Let's say we replicated Earth many times. Um, I would. I, I sort of think that the origin of life is more or less deterministic. So I would expect that most of those planets, maybe not all, but most of them would produce some kind of life. I would also expect that um, things to do with uh, the biochemistry of metabolism would be likely to occur, but maybe not necessarily very quickly. So, so I think there's, there could be an arbitrarily long waiting time for something like cyanobacteria. Mm-hmm. So in, because in that, and in that, I would take the very long term evolution experiment. So the idea that you have these 12 populations that, that all have the potential to harness this energy source of citrate, but in 60,000 generations, only one of them does. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, maybe if the, if the long term evolution experiment continues for another, I don't know, 20,000 or let's, let's say, let's say, I don't know, a million generations, maybe more of those populations will find it or, or, but but I, I think there could be there could be waiting times um, that are either much longer or much less long. We, we we don't really know where we are because we don't know what the distribution is. Don't you think though that it was quite remarkable that within only sixty thousand generations they did find it happened once? I mean, I forget the numbers, but it was five hundred million years. Okay, this was this is a little bit in question, but it's millions and millions of years. Yes, but it's much more difficult to to. It, at least the form of photosynthesis that cyanobacteria do it, to the number of mutations that would have need to occur and been selected is much, much larger. Mm-hmm. I mean, E. coli, in the absence of oxygen, can can bring in this molecule and use it. So it's only in the experiment there's oxygen present in the medium, and mm-hmm. so they can't do it. But it's mm-hmm. a very, very trivial change um, in terms of in terms of its biochemistry. Whereas for, to, to, to do the sort of um, managing of light that cyanobacteria are doing, it's, it's uh, very um, sophisticated. Can you, knowing the number of changes that need to be made to the genome, can you back out from that experiment how long you should expect it to take? I don't know. And I think that that's a, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I'm actually a bit obsessed with this waiting time question. Um, I mean, there is a sort of mathematical uh, way of thinking about waiting times as well, I understand, mm-hmm. but that's not what I'm good at. And, um, but I, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I think it is, it, it is clearly the case that here there was also, you know, there's each of the, of the really big evolutionary changes that we see and are interested by um, is built on something that went before. And they had to happen in that order. So mm-hmm. you can't imagine, you can't imagine, had cyanobacteria never, never evolved, 
there would never have been eukaryotes, plants, mm. humans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you could imagine a situation where, where because because the waiting time is so much longer, um, it just never happens. Mm. But but because I don't know enough, because we don't know enough about the distribution, and we don't, I, it, it's very difficult to know where we are in that distribution, um, and. It, you know, um, I would imagine that something like photosynthesis would evolve relatively, rel- relatively um, frequently, uh, mm. but whether the ox- the water splitting, oxygen releasing photosynthesis would also evolve frequently, and then whether, I mean, to me, one of the one of the most singular events is the origin of eukaryotes, mm. um, and whether you would automatic, I mean, because there've been so many bacteria and archaea live together all the time. Mm-hmm. And yet it seems that only once did they fuse and, and evolve into something else. But that's only if you follow your hypothesis, right? No, no. I think everybody agrees that it, everybody agrees that the, the fusion happened. Um, what people don't agree on is whether, whether it, there was already something tr- starting to become a bit eukaryote-like. Mm. So the reason I think that that's a mistake is that, you know, if we look around at um, other animals, mm-hmm. we can see elements of things that we consider unique to humans. So we can see rudiments of language. We can see other animals that use tools. We can see other animals that do farming. Um, you know, there's, there's, but none of them happens, except in humans, those things don't happen together. Mm-hmm. Um, and in humans, it's to a much greater degree. And so, and so I think that, yes, I mean, if you look at bacteria and archaea, you can find whispers of eukaryotic traits. Um, mm-hmm. But it's only in the eukaryote that you see them fully manifested. Um, and so I think that it's, you know, you can look at bacteria and you say, well, this bacterium is actually quite big for a bacterium. And this, this one seems to have something a little bit like, the sort of looks a bit like a nucleus. And this one has straight chromosomes. And, but the fact is they're not all happening together. Mm-hmm. And in the, it seems to me that it's only with this fusion that you would have, um, I, I can't imagine another way for it to happen. Maybe my imagination is poor. Maybe, maybe there are other possibilities, but, but for me, I think it's, uh, it was, it's a change in the energetic architecture, Mm -hmm. um, that released a lot more possibilities. And I can't imagine, as I said, maybe it's my imagination, but I can't imagine another way for that to have happened. So does this in some sense contrast to the absorption of the chloroplast and the mitochondria i imagine correct me if i'm wrong here i imagine that could happen quite quickly within sort of a generation whereas the picture you're again correct me if i'm wrong but the picture you're painting is that you carry it's a sort of a grab bag of tricks that may have evolved over many 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 generations until you you got a specific combination that worked particularly well. So I wanted the first thing I want to do is to separate mitochondria and chloroplasts mm-hmm. because the chloroplast was the, the ancestral cyanobacterium was taken up by a cell that was already a eukaryote, mm. and that is in many ways much more straightforward. And mm-hmm. although the extent to which the chloroplast is residual is quite extreme, s- very similar things have ha- like to it have happened repeatedly within the eukaryotes. Mm-hmm. So it's really bacteria and archaea really don't do that. They te- there's only a handful of known examples of one bacterium taking another even partly inside it. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of the examples are rather peculiar and they're very few. Now, it may be that we haven't studied them enough, but it may also be that it's just very unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a number of reasons, I think, to think that it's very unusual including um, the fact that uh, bacteria are often living in highly cooperative arrangements anyway, and also the bacteria are often very highly defended. Mm-hmm. You know, that the, it's very difficult in general to get into a bacterial cell. Viruses have enormous uh, obstacles to overcome to get into a bacterial cell. Um, and that's just a virus, and it's not even the virus going in, it's just the genes going in. Mm-hmm. You know, the virus capsule itself stays on the outside. Um, and and so so I think that the the particular circumstances that led to this fusion I mean I, I, I do think that it, it it there have been you know bacteria and archaea let's say they've been here for four billion years mm. they are live in close proximity all the time 
as far as we know, a fusion between them that led to something else happened only once. Mm. So this would be, this is a pretty great filter. I, I think so. Does, does this shift your perspective on the Fermi paradox at all? Um, so my, so the Fermi paradox is this, so I should say that it's named the Fermi paradox, but Enrico Fermi was not the first person to raise the question. Who was it? I think it's been raised since ever since people have been speculating. I mean, there were ancient Greeks who were writing uh, imaginary stories about, um, about other worlds that were inhabited by lamps. This, it might be called the, is it because Fermi had his Fermi problems, right? His where, Fermi problems. Yeah, where, where he would say, you know, how many piano tuners are there in Berlin or something like this. And you had to sort of, through some logical deduction, determine order of magnitude. And this is, this sounds like a Fermi problem, right? I think he's also just a, he was just a, you know, he liked, he liked taking bets on all kinds of things. So I think he just enjoyed, he enjoyed, and, and he was gregarious and apparently and uh, well known. Guy. And, and, um, and so it just sort of, stuck but the basic question is if the universe is full of planets and if intelligent life life is common why don't we see any evidence of it Hmm. essentially Hmm. and um so i think you know it's a parlor game the fermi paradox i mean and i think what the people in the sense that you can't win it or in in the sense that it's 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 speculative. Nobody nobody knows the answer. So the question is, the question is, what is it that what is the answer that most people favour? Oh, just to come back, there was also there was a, a Russian whose name I've forgotten who posed it in the twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a it's it's a question to which no one knows the answer. But the answer that that you favour mm. tells you something about you. I think it's a Rorschach test. Kind of. Yeah, so I this think is a so. good uh, personality question then again. So, so I think, I mean, you know, there are some people who like to think, well, intelligent life is common, mm-hmm. but they haven't revealed themselves to us yet. And when we reach a certain level of technological sophistication, we too will be invited to the galactic intelligence party. Um, I, I think that that reflects one aspect of uh, psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, my... It's, it's clear that there are many different planets now, which it wasn't when Fermi asked this question. It's clear that there are, you know, even just within the Milky Way, there are probably billions of planets, uncountable billions. Um, how many of them are suitable for life is not clear, but probably some large number. But whether that life is going to follow the same trajectory on the same kind of time scale and... Um, within the same sort of time zone, so to speak. Mm. You know, maybe there have been many civilizations that have appeared and disappeared. Or maybe we're really it. Mm. I mean, we don't know. Maybe we will know something one day. But right now, we, we don't know. I mean, my personal suspicion is that life of some sort is relatively common. Life like us is relatively rare. That's my guess. But rare and common, what does it mean when you have billions to play with anyway? I mean, you know, it could be it could be rare, but still a lot. Then let's let's uh, say within our galaxy. But even within our galaxy, I mean, it could be rare and still a lot. But it it could. I mean, the distances are enormous. Mm. And also, so one hypothesis that has been put forward, which reflects a completely different frame of mind, is that the truly evolved civilizations um, reach a steady state with their planets and basically turn inwards. And and in, and instead of um, instead of sort of using up their own resources, they conserve their resources, and mm-hmm. that that's the true wisdom. Now that's a, that reflects a different kind of psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, so so you know, I mean, the, it's so it's possible that there are many intelligent civilizations out there, but we don't see them because they they don't want to be seen, mm-hmm. not because they're excluding us from a club. <laughs> But because they're doing that, you know, they, they are stewarding their planet. Hmm. I want to move towards the end of the conversation. And I have just two more questions. Um, before the interview, you told me rather cryptically that you're against life on Earth. What do you mean? So I'm not against life and I'm not against Earth. I'm against on 
I think that the phrase suggests a superficiality. And I don't think that's true. I think that life is of the earth in the sense that I, I personally am prepared to bet that life arose here, um, produced by the processes of the earth, and that life is a, a fundamental aspect of what makes this planet what it is today. Mm-hmm. And so I think that talking about life on earth is completely misleading. It makes it sound like it's sort of just been plonked here as a sort of surface phenomenon. And, mm-hmm. you know, okay, perhaps there's no life in the mantle, probably not. But nevertheless, just about everywhere we've ever tried to go, we've discovered that there are other organisms there first. Mm-hmm. So in the deepest gold mines in South Africa, there are organisms living in, in, the, in, in, in seeps of water in cracks in the rock. How far down? Uh, the, the deepest mile, the deepest uh, mines are several kilometers. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it really just goes, all, well, not all the way down, but for several kilometers, you can find back, bacteria, simple. archaea, microbes of some kind or another. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, in the sediments, below the sediments of the, of the deepest parts mm-hmm. of the ocean. You know, the Mariana Trench, I think, is 11 kilometers deep. Um, and there are, there are animals living on the seafloor there and microbes living beneath it. Um, I mean, the, the planet is permeated by life, mm-hmm. absolutely permeated by it. And, and the, the, you know, hot springs, boiling acid, um, soda lakes, um, clouds, you know, it, it's, it's a planet that has been permeated by life. And, and to suggest that life is somehow not integral to to this place and to what this place is today is a tremendous mistake and i think that and i think it it shapes our thoughts about the world uh, in a way that is not helpful and i also think that the um one of the things that has become clear to me thinking about the history of life on earth is that is that habitability is often talked about as something binary either a planet is habitable or it isn't but what, if, you, if you define it instead by how much life a planet mm. can support, then over time, the Earth has been becoming far more habitable. Um, and I think that that's this, this, this idea that it's not a binary property, but in fact an evolving property, is, is extremely important. And, and that, that, the, you know, that, that life is shaping everything from you know, clouds to weather to climate, but also rocks and rivers. And I mean, it's, it's just, this is, this, is, this is the Earth. Hmm. what do you think's next so we've talked about the evolution of of earth and these different energy periods or this accumulation of energy possibilities rather what's the next step where are we going to go into the machine what what's the what what's your prophecy for the future well my crystal ball doesn't work very well um but i i think there are things that i i think are um, likely to happen and then things that I think it would be nice if they happened and they're not necessarily the same. I mean, we haven't talked very much about, about fire and the extent to which humans have been shaped by the technology of fire and also by, by cooking. And, and I mean, so there's, a, uh, there's certainly some people who believe, and I find the arguments quite persuasive, that, that, um, that humans are obligate um, cooked food eaters uh, and that this has shaped our physiology very dramatically and also our brains. Um, and that, and that, together, uh, also the social life, you know, sitting together around a hearth, keeping a fire going, all these kinds of things. Um, and so, I think the question is, um, can we can we imagine? Um, well, I think it's different. The question is, what do we value? What do we value? Do we value life? Do we value machines? Do we value some sort of weird superpower? that we imagine and conjecture, what is it that we actually value? And, and I think the answer to that question is going to be very different for different people. And I, for me, what I value is the diversity of nature and the incredible beauty. I mean, I'm the sort of person who thinks that, you know, it's, it's, it's free astonishment. <laughs> you know, you can just go out there and be mesmerized by the beauty of a flower and that that's amazing and remarkable and that that is valuable. And mm-hmm. that so let me say something a bit, try to put that into a more possibly broader perspective. As far as we know, Earth is the only planet to have life. 
It may be that there are others. It may even be that a planet like Mars is home to life. It may be that it was home to life if it, is, if it isn't anymore. But we don't need to go to Mars to know that whatever has happened there is extremely different from what happened here. If there was life on Mars, or even if there is still, it has not been transformative of that planet in the way that life here has been. This planet, I believe, is the most interesting that any of us will ever know about. And I think that that interest itself is, is extraordinarily valuable and we will never see anything like it. Olivia Judson, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much.